This episode of Tales from the Backlog, like every episode, is brought to you by the wonderful people who support the show over at patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson. These personal heroes of mine are Chris Nelson, the top three podcast crew, Zul Geek, Eric Guess, Rick Firestone, Nick Ficori, Jill, Soccer, ZNA, Cupcake, Kyle, Christian S., Matt aka Stormageddon, JD, Doug Leaf, Jason Emery, Rob Shack, Brian Skersha, Randall, and many more. If you'd like to be like them, you can head on over to patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson, where in return for your generous donation, you will get bonus content, voting rights on what games I do on the show, and much more. Thank you all for your support, and with that being said, let's get on to Metroid 2. Hello everybody, my name is Dave Jackson and you're listening to Tales from the Backlog. This is a video games review podcast where each week I'm joined by a guest to bring a game out of the backlog, play it, and discuss. Today we got a little bit of a special show. First of all, I have three wonderful guests today. They're all friends of the show. First up, we've got host of Men of Steel and Another Pass podcasts and professional spider ball stuntman Case Aiken. Welcome to the show, Case. Hi, everyone. I am so glad to be here to talk about everything today. Hell yeah. Uh, Glad to have you on the show for the first time. And we're joined by the two hosts of Fun and Games and Omega Metroids in Disguise, Matt Storm and Jeff Moon. And welcome to the show, guys. Making Metroid faces, but you can't (laughs) see it. Da 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 That was uh that was impressive. Thank you. You might have to shut this show down. That was Jeff is a professional voice actor. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh so We always give our guests a little bit of time at the beginning of the show before we get into our three-way breakdown of Metroid 2 and its various remakes today. A little bit of time for the guests to explain the stuff that they make. Case, it is your first time on the show, so I will kick it to you first uh, to explain your podcasts. Yeah. uh, So again, thank you for having me on. I love talking video games. I don't usually get a chance to because my shows are not video game specific, except for a couple of random exceptions where... Uh, we, we dig into like spinoff material. Uh, so Men of Steel is a Superman and Superman adjacent show where we talk about the, the archetype of Superman and how it's like a, a positive, fun fantasy that it means a lot to a lot of people and has had so many permutations in comic books and other types of, of fiction. So we'll talk about Superman, but we'll also talk about things like Invincible or The Boys or, you know, all kinds of material where Ooh. It, it, it the, the the line that we draw is is as blurred as it can be it's mostly just like let's have a fun conversation about nerdy comic booky kind of stuff um Hell yeah and i do that with my co-host jay mike falson and that's part of the certain point of view podcast network along with my other show another pass which is a movie show where we discuss what could have been done at the time of production with movies that we find fascinating but flawed um hmm. where it's could it have been re-edited in a way that would have made it a little bit tighter could it have been rewritten um and i do that with my co-host sam alisea and then every five episodes on that show we'll look at a proof of concept movies that actually did a really good job of overcoming crazy adversity like huge production issues um and so both of those are on the uh, certain point of view podcast network and uh <laughs> the other guests matt used to be my editor jeff is my current editor for for those so uh they they <laughs> both have uh have had their fingers in in those particular pies um and then also all the certain point of view uh youtube stuff is uh, mostly my baby so we do videos on uh superman analogs we do clips we do video versions of the uh the fun and game side quest series so uh all, all that stuff is is me the output's been a little bit weird recently because i just had a baby i mean my wife had a baby and i <laughs> You're I'm not there. sleeping, but my my <laughs> wife's the one recovering from giving birth. Uh, <laughs> but uh, all all that you can find over at certainpov.com or look up certain POV media on YouTube. Hell yeah, awesome! Uh, I'm curious about another pass. It sounds like a, a cool idea. Can you give me an example of uh, something that you? have given another pass to? Sure, sure. Uh, so that show actually started off because um, the the network started as a Star Wars uh, program specifically. Certain Point of View was a Star Wars podcast. And I had brought to the host of that show the idea of, hey, let's look at 
specifically Revenge of the Sith from the perspective mm. of if the first two movies had come out and discuss like what could you have done to like have stuck the landing a little bit better, assuming Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones came out exactly as they were. And you were like an editor brought in or, or a script doctor a little bit before shooting kind of scenario. Sure. Um, and I, I actually owe Jeff Moon in that uh, we used to work together and we would just like spitball those kind of like weird s- situations all the time. Uh, and so that became kind of the idea for the show of like, yeah, we'll we'll say, all right, X, Y and Z, like real world details, details are in place. What could you have done considering that adversity to like tighten it up a little bit more? Hell yeah. Awesome. Uh, sounds cool. Like, um, you know, an uncommon take on a movie podcast, I would say, not just kind of talking about the movies you've seen lately, uh, kind of putting a more analytical eye on that stuff. Right. So that's yeah. pretty cool. And with a real eye, eye to try to like be observant of the actual circumstances of movie making, uh, mm-hmm. there, there are a lot of like script doctor kinds of shows where it's sort of like pie in the sky. And for us, like some of the fun is being like, well, what are the restrictions? What were the things that you just couldn't do anything about? Like we did Judge Dredd and that notoriously Sylvester Stallone would not allow the movie to be made without showing his face at a few points, even though that's like anathema to the character. So we had to like figure out an episode, like how would you do that situation and make fans okay with it all? Hell yeah. Awesome. And uh, next up we have, like I said, Matt and Jeff from the fun and games podcast and uh, many other podcasts uh, between the two of you, although that's probably mostly on Matt's side. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go first to talk about fun and games and then Matt can take the rest of the way. Yeah. Take it away, Jeff. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Matt and I are also on the Certain POV Network producing Fun and Games podcast, where it is a sort of video game culture show. We talk about a lot of things that go on throughout the history and present of video games. We have done some serious retrospectives. We have done some discussions about certain trends and things that come and go. We're not a review show. We're not a news show. But we always try to bring an optimistic view to games and gaming and gaming culture and look at games as a as a medium, as a means of telling stories and, frankly, having fun. Because, you know, you've got movie podcasts, you've got book podcasts, and video games can be about the, the games and the characters, but can also be about the experiences and the personal stories that come from interfacing with them. And we love having those as well. And over the past few years, we've also gotten to bring in creators of indie games and larger titles as well and get to hear about the process and hear about how games have affected them and what got them into the industry as well. And we also produce another show on top of that, but I'm going to let Matt talk about that. Sure. So uh, fans of this very fine show will probably be already familiar with SideQuest, as Dave has done two and is working on a third. Uh, SideQuest is a series where we bring hosts, um, Listeners, fans, pretty much anyone with a microphone or an iPhone who wants to record themselves talking for five to 15 minutes about a game they love and why they love it. Um, this concept was born out of what Jeff was referring to, the incredible negativity online around games and especially certain kinds of games, major franchises. And I wanted a place for people to non-judgmentally talk about the things they love with no kind of uh, poo-pooing of those topics. And uh, it's been really a lot of fun. We've done... As of recording now, but by the time this comes out, probably another 10 or 15, uh, but 230 something episodes already, uh, which is kind mm-hmm. of absurd. Uh, we're coming up on big episode 250, which we haven't decided what that is, but for every 50 episodes, we do a milestone where it's a little longer format. Me and Jeff are on the show and we bring a guest and we kind of round robin. It's not too dissimilar to this, but more, less analytical and more kind of just a like love fest for a game that all three of the hosts love. Because mm-hmm. no matter what, much like another pass, like any movie, any game is somebody's favorite game. And giving it the platform and time to share that we think is very important. Yeah, yep, for sure. Well, and that's kind of a, the, a thing about certain point of view. Everything that we're working on is usually like from a place of love and from a place of positivity. And that's like one of the through lines of all our shows. Mm-hmm. For sure. Totally. And then really quickly, I can talk about the other stuff that I do because I don't want to be here all day. Um, I do a TV and movie podcast where we bring a guest on to talk about the most recent thing they've watched as well as talk about that guest and what they do. We brought Dave on for that. It was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I learned about uh, I Think You Should Leave, which once my Netflix (laughs) isn't canceled anymore, I will watch. Uh, But I have watched some of it online. Uh, And that is with the incredible Rachel Quirky Shank. And then I also do... What is the name of that show? Oh, Screen Snark. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, (laughs) This is why why I keep Jeff around. He keeps me on my toes. So Uh, organized. So organized. (laughs) The most organized. Um, The most. 
uh, that's called Screen Snark, which is a lot of fun. And then I also do Reignite, which is a retrospective podcast. It was originally about the Mass Effect franchise. We've now moved on to Dragon Age. I host that with the incredible Frankie Bradley, Bradley the Strange. Uh, and uh, we're currently in our Dragon Age Origins run. Um, it was a lot of fun. Recently, I listened to your uh, Baldur's Gate episode, and you guys talk a little bit mm-hmm. about Dragon Age because that first Dragon Age was almost a CRPG, kind of. It was like this in-between because of the pausing combat. And so, yeah, uh, it's been a roller coaster playing that game again because it crashes a lot on PC, but I do have a lot of love for Bioware, uh, but their PC ports are notoriously terrible uh, in almost all forms, uh, and so that's been a little rough. Come on, Bioware, remaster the Dragon Age games. We need it. Uh, and then I do a ton of audio editing and production on the side, too. I am the audio producer for the Game Informer show, which has been a lot of fun. Alex Van Aken is a delight, and that show is a lot of fun to edit every week, and uh, yeah, I think that covers everything. Yeah. Um, I, so for fun and games, uh, just starting there, like I was a guest on the show. We did an episode about emergent gameplay and that was mm-hmm. good. Um, yeah. but the, the episodes range, uh, a wide, uh, array of topics. So I remember a really fun episode about, um, hardware modifications. That was really, really interesting. Cause I am, I'm afraid to take apart my PS5 to clean it, let alone <laughs> like, mess with internals on anything. The uh, developer interviews are always good. I'll always remember the trombone champ uh, interview with the developer. It was so much fun. fun. Um, So a lot of good stuff there. Uh, Like you said, not really reviews, but not not just like a kind of BS every week type of show. It's always, you've always got a focused topic and I appreciate that. I really love listening to that. And I keep saying this when I do replay Mass Effect. I'll go back and listen along with uh, with Reignite. Yeah, it's gonna happen go. sometime. Yeah, yeah, it's, you kind, it's kind of a good as, like uh, asymmetrical book club or asynchronous book club. Yeah, what were you gonna say, Matt? Oh, I was just gonna say, did have you played the Mass Effect games for the backlog? Not for the podcast. No, I played them all uh, ten years ago. Okay, so then, yeah. so they are nebulously somewhere in the backlog and could appear on the show. Yes. That would be a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, I got the uh, I got the mm. legendary editions for free from Amazon or something like that. Oh, nice. So I got them. Just uh, you know, you know how it goes. Just gotta yeah, find gotta time. find the time. Yeah, I, yep. yeah. I feel like this point, Mass Effect is one of those games where every eighty percent of regular gamers kind of go like, "Yeah, I should play that. How should I get it?" Look around in your digital everything. You probably yeah. already have it. Yeah, it's on. Um, it's on Game Pass now. Uh, Amazon gave it away for free. You probably have it somewhere. So. <laughs> you probably have it. Yeah, so uh, I will give the uh, the recommendation uh, to go down in the show notes already. Check down uh, for links to Men of Steel, Another Pass, Fun and Games, Reignite, and Screen Snark. Hell yeah, got all of them there. I think a lot yeah, of podcasts did. to check Nicely out. Done. A lot of a uh, lot of wonderful hosts here on the show today. Today, the four of us are going to be comparing and discussing the three versions of Metroid Two. So starting with Metroid Two: Return of Samus. Uh, from 1991 for the Game Boy, uh, the original game, AM2R, which stands for another Metroid 2 remake, which is a fan remake uh, by Milton Guasti, I'm guessing is how you pronounce that, released Looks in 2016. Right. Um, yeah, fan game only for PC and because uh, Nintendo shut it down. <laughs> and the reason Nintendo shut it down is because Nintendo did their own remake called Metroid Samus Returns, uh, which was done by Mercury Steam and Nintendo published uh, for the 3DS in 2017. So again, that's why they shut down that fan project because they had their own in the pipeline. Spoiler policy for this episode today. This is a little bit weird because this is going to be a different structure from the regular way that this show works. We're going to work our way game by game. And I, in my opinion, this is not a game where people should be super worried about being spoiled. And as Case pointed out, if you have played Super Metroid, you know how this game ends, because they tell you right at the beginning. But I have to stay on brand, so we're going to do little mini spoiler breaks. Uh, I'll tell you to check down in the show notes for when the section on each game begins. So with that being said, we're going to start today by giving our histories with Metroid 2 and with the Metroid series in general. So, um, Jeff, I'll kick it to you first. When did you first play Metroid 2 or any of these remakes? And uh, what's your general history with the series? I think I first played Metroid 2 a couple of years ago. I, in my collection, had a copy of Return of Samus, but I didn't grow up with it. 
I don't mm-hmm. remember if it was part of my wife's collection or something like that, but I tried it a little bit, didn't get very far, and didn't really dig into it until we decided we were doing this and saw it as a great excuse to do it and play through all of these wonderful versions because that kind of makes sense for me with Metroid. I didn't probably the first Metroid game that I played that was fully mine was Super Metroid way after the fact. I played the original Metroid a ton at my cousin's house. I would Mm -hmm. always start and fail and start and fail. And I knew the Justin (laughs) Bailey code and I'd screw around with that. I played Super Metroid at a friend's place. And then years after the PS1 was a thing, I got a Super Nintendo. I got Super Metroid and I played the crap out of it. And I kept up with the 2D Metroids ever since then. I still have never played Prime, but that'll change soon. Yeah. One of these days. Like one we all say, days. one of these days. When one of we these find days. The time. <laughs> uh, Matt, how about you? So for me, uh, I am a diehard Metroid fan. Um, I am an obsessive about the franchise. It's the franchise that got me into Metroidvanias. Still a terrible genre name, but yet we continue to roll with it. Um <laughs> I played the original Metroid on Nintendo, but never really owned a copy. I think I had rented it. I never actually owned the original Metroid until they did the NES Classics on the Game Boy Advance. Uh, I don't still have that copy, unfortunately, and uh, Mm. I'm ashamed to say. But uh, my earliest experience with Metroid 2 was on the Game Boy. I had it growing up. Um, I played it here and there, but I never finished it. Um, Notoriously, of course, Metroid 1 and 2 are some of the hardest games in the oeuvre of Metroid. Um, And then with the franchise as a whole, I've been following it since the beginning. I would say I liked Super Metroid, but the game that got me really into Metroidvania is like super into the franchise was, of course, Metroid Fusion, a game I never shut up about and play constantly. Uh, Mm -hmm. And um, I've been obsessed with the franchise ever since. Um, I, as far as all the games here, um, I played Metroid. I tried to play replay Metroid to the original Game Boy one on the Nintendo Switch online. I got about an hour in and said, F this, I'm done. I'm just not. I'll watch a Let's Play, which I did. Um, (laughs) AM2R, I played uh, a few weeks ago and played it through in a couple sessions. Um, And then Return of Samus. So something that um, Dave didn't mention is that Return of Samus was one of the last 3DS games to come out and came out after the Switch came out. So I did not own this game when it came out. But when... They, when Dread was announced and I lost my goddamn mind and they announced that Mercury Steam, the creator, the people who worked on the Samus Returns remake also were making Dread. I went, well, I guess I should play that. And so I downloaded it onto the 3DS and played it. This was probably, I guess, two years ago now because it would have been the summer yeah. before the release of Dread. Um, mm-hmm. and I played it while I was on vacation kind of slowly over the course of a week. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I I love the Metroid franchise, flaws and all, and it is still one of my favorite Metroidvania franchises pretty much ever. All right, and Case, how about you? Uh, so, um, I Metroid 2 I bought uh, within the first month that it came out. It was uh, one of my, like, first big Game Boy games that I, like, called out as one that I, I really wanted. Uh, Metroid 2 is... Uh, the like where I entered the franchise, um, and uh, while I owned a copy of one, played one, uh, two was my entry point, and then Super Metroid I love because it's it's a classic for a reason, like it <laughs> up there in a lot of people's lists for like best games, mm-hmm. um, and then um, Fusion played a ton, Zero Mission played a ton, um, and so those those four are probably the ones that I've played the most between two Super Metroid and then the two Game Boy Advance games. Um, I never really played the Prime series. Uh, I like I bought them for when uh, when they did the trilogy on Wii um, and didn't get very far just because it was hard to stay focused on Wii games, I found. Um, and then other I never really had any interest in. Uh, and only <laughs> I, I, I almost bought a Game Boy or pardon me, I almost bought a 3DS for the sake of playing Samus Returns when it came out. Um, I ultimately didn't because at the time I was in this like state of video gaming where it was like very rarely. And I had such a backlog of games where it was like, I can't justify buying a video game system just to play this one remake of a game, even if mm-hmm. it's a remake of a game I really like. And also I had 
become very invested in uh, AM2R when I first heard about it. And it was a game that I was like, I need to play this. I need to play this. I need to play this. I've downloaded it on like my computer. I never like really like play games on my computer, but I need to play this at some point. And then ultimately I found the Android port and I had um, the uh, the Razer Kishi, like the controller uh, snap on that I use for my, ga- uh, my Galaxy Note. Uh, and that was like my like, Oh, right. I need to get back into Metroid games and like played through AM2R and was like, yes. All right. I am back. I am back in for Metroidvania's <laughs> baby. Uh, <laughs> and it was actually, um, I had reached out to talk about AM2R specifically because it was a game that I really enjoyed and wanted to bring up here because that had been like a big, like not white whale per se, but like one that I'd wanted to touch on for a long time and said that like, well, but we can't talk about Metroid games without bringing Matt and Jeff over. Uh, <laughs> right. Um, but, but Metroid two was my entry point and I've played it to death. I played it to death on the original game boy. It was a game that I have really strong, like memories of growing up because my dad actually got really into it and he was not a big video game person, but the Metroid series was a big series for him. And so we would like kind of play that together. Uh, there was nice. one, this one big family trip that we took. Uh, so I, I grew up in the DC area and we took, <laughs> we took a train down to Disney World one year, uh, like the, where you can like have your car on the, on the train, like, so that it's there when you arrive, mm-hmm. uh, situation. And it's like a 14 hour train ride. Um, and so <laughs> we, overnight, we just like played through this whole damn thing. And then the whole trip we were playing it and then same way on the way back. Um, and so like really strong family connections with my dad. And then when Super Metroid came out, um, that was also like the one game he was like really invested in. So I have like really, really positive, like, nostalgic memories for it um when i got the super game boy you could say that i always put a red tint when i played metroid 2 because i have rose tinted glasses always for this game nice nice oh yeah incredible yeah um you you did bring this uh so you were the the one who brought this onto the show basically with the idea to talk about am2r and it just so happened that I had had am2r installed on my computer for about two years just kind of waiting for someone to kick me in the ass and get me to play it. But I had the idea because um, they had just recently put Game Boy games on Nintendo Switch Online mm-hmm. uh, and Metroid 2 is on that. So I was like, oh, and my 3DS that I hacked also has Metroid Samus Returns on it. Okay, I have all three of these. Why not just play all three? I love that I'm the only one here who just has a physical copy of Samus Returns for the 3DS in their <laughs> collection. It's like we're playing this. Oh, God, it's so hard to find. No, I, I bought it on Super Sale because, yeah, it came out after the Switch and no one cared. And I yeah. knew I'd want to play it eventually. And here we are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But um, this is the first time I played any of these three games was getting ready for this episode here. Yeah. Um, I had I think actually I, I had played maybe 10 minutes of Metroid 2 like a while ago and booted it up and been like, whoa, this is really different from the other Metroid games. I don't like this. And then turned it <laughs> off. Um, <laughs> but uh, Fusion was the first Metroid game I played. I'm old enough. I've said many times I'm old enough to have grown up with a Super Nintendo, but I didn't. So I never played Super Metroid until uh, maybe three or four years ago, the first time I played that game. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really seeing Samus in Super Smash Brothers that made me want to play metroid games and there was no metroid on the n64 so we had to wait for metroid fusion so i played that that was my first um and then yeah fusion zero mission i played metroid dread there's an episode of this show uh way in the back catalog of this show like first 20 episodes or so i would say um and uh that's a really good episode i enjoyed that game so i consider myself a fan of the series but uh, there was always something about Metroid 2. It has a pretty bad reputation among like the general gaming uh, sphere uh, within the Metroid series, especially people are always like, play Super Metroid, play Fusion, play Zero Mission, Metroid 2, eh, I don't know. So I was always a little hesitant, you know? Yeah. It's an incredible game in terms of what they were able to accomplish in, what was that, 1989, 1990 with... OG Game Boy technology and how yeah. much they were able to fit in there and what they were able to do. It's one of those games, and Matt and I talk about this a lot in our show. There are games that are historically important. You should know about them, but you don't need to play them in their original style. I think it's worth playing if you've got save states or an external map. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is 
kind of impressive what they were able to pull off um, on the original Game Boy. So this is going to be the chance to listen to a little bit of music from the original Metroid 2. When we come back, we're going to dive into that original game. So Metroid 2, uh, Return of Samus, the original Game Boy game, uh, like we said, came out in 1991. And um, I should say when I was replaying these games uh, for this episode, I played them in the release order. So I played Metroid 2 first, uh, which I think was a good idea. It would have been kind of rough to go from Samus Returns back to this game, just if you get used to how it feels to play. But I'll give the little setup for these games. They all follow the same premise. Um, They all feature Samus on a mission to the Metroid home planet of SR388 to destroy the Metroids, 47 in total. Uh, So basically you're going on a one-woman extinction event quest in this game. You're going to wipe out an entire species. And uh, surely this will not come back to bite you later in the series whatsoever. Right? No. Are we right here? No. <laughs> no, no not, never. Not. How could no it, consequences whatsoever. No. Removing a predator from the ecosystem. Yeah. If if we've learned anything about history, completing uh, doing a complete genocide is never bad. It never always bad. is a good thing. I and also enjoy that with that. that number, I get the limitations of gaming, but it just sounds like the black-footed ferrets are too dangerous to exist on this earth. We've got them all in one cave system. Exactly. We need to send a master yeah. chief to destroy them. Well, it's the only way to be sure. Like, I think you, we have to emphasize the fact that the Metroid franchise is so inspired by the Alien franchise. Absolutely. And like this game specifically really feels like Aliens, like yes. where it's like we have to wipe them out because, oh, my God, this is the deadliest thing ever. Can you imagine if they get out? Yeah, exactly. And it's the deadliest thing ever. And how many of them are there? Forty seven. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's well, it. Only for Apex predators. You like <laughs> it's exponential <laughs> increases from the the top of the food chain all the way down. And mm-hmm. as we know, when we get to the the deepest like layers of SR three eight eight, there isn't a lot of life to sustain them. <laughs> no, right. We would destroy exactly. thousands of Cybermen with one Dalek. You know, just <laughs> doesn't matter how high up on the food chain you are. A population of forty seven is not really going to be able to sustain itself for very long. Uh, actually, I don't know how Metroids reproduce, uh, but yeah, 47 is not a whole lot. <laughs> there, There's a lot about the Metroids that I am not alone in being like, you know what? I love playing these games. You do whatever, you crazy little jellyfish. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is a series that I play where I don't ask a whole lot of questions. Uh, Fusion Fusion is one of the only games that I played where I'm like, Oh, I, I'm going to think a little bit more about this because uh, mm-hmm. Fusion does some cool stuff with uh, with the X and with the SAX and all of that stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and cutscenes, and we have an internal monologue for the character. There, there's Fusion is where story really comes into play that isn't being uh, experienced, where it's actually being told to us. Yeah. So this game, um, you start out with that mission at the beginning, and then they kind of let you go, and you've got some environmental storytelling along the way. And then something happens at the very end of the game. That's basically the story for Metroid 2. So um, one thing that I, like when I first booted this game up, because I have played, you know, the 10 or 15 minutes of the original Metroid before I was like, nope, and then moved on to another game. And I've played half of Super Metroid like four times. Um, (laughs) But then I had never played this. So I booted this up and I always like, I get the timelines mixed up. This came out before Super Metroid. So this is like an evolutionary step before that game that I thought of as the evolutionary step, if that makes sense. Like this is really hard to place. And so like when I booted this up, it felt older than I was expecting it to feel. And it makes sense because it is older than the other Metroid games that I have experience with. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I was shocked to find out that Metroid 2 had accumulated the sort of bad rap overall. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I, I, like I said, I have very rose tinted glasses when, when looking at this game. But one of the big things for this is that it is such an early Game Boy game. I mean, it's 1991. The Game Boy came out at the tail end of 89. Um, so we, we don't have a lot at this point. Like, yeah, sure. The Super Nintendo was out, but like, I didn't have a Super Nintendo right when it came out. I had it like several years later. Like, I think it was like 92 or 93 when I finally got one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's uh, y- y- like games had advanced at this point, but and for n- me, 1991 SNES games were like Super Castlevania four, which was. Right. You know, a great game and a Super Nintendo game, but that gives you an idea of where they were in terms of evolution. Yeah, it was before A Link to the Past. It's before Super Mario World, Mm -hmm. before a lot of those things we think of and associate. That was a launch title, wasn't it? Yeah, Mario World was 90, but but that's not the... Was it? Okay. Yeah, regardless, sorry. But regardless of the the point there, like... um, like Super Metroid for me was, or not probably not Super Metroid, Metroid 2 for me was the first game where the character looked like the box art. You know, like yeah. Nintendo games, mm. no one looks like the box art, even the <laughs> best of the Nintendo games. Like there, uh, there yeah. are, I mean, like what, like maybe some of the Konami games, maybe some Capcom games. But and like, like Mega the OG Man Black doesn't Box look like, games. That's <laughs> especially, it. Well, yeah, the OG is, but that, but that's in a different scenario where the OG right. looks like a specific kind of thing. Whereas like the Metroid 2 art is like this very detailed armor for the character. It's a really striking pose. I've referenced it in podcast art for things that I've, I've produced um like it's a it's a really cool looking image and then you get into the game and it actually looks like that like sure it's it's monochrome but it actually like the details on the character are really good in that regard um it is limited by the hardware yeah but they do a lot with the hardware that they have and like it's so early in the game boy run like sure mario land 2 looks better like of course like we ha- like the, the hardware gets pushed harder and harder because game boy's was so popular and had so much like actual people working on it. But the original game is just like from the standpoint of an early Game Boy title, a, a really strong effort. And especially when compared to the original Metroid, which is, I'm sorry, unplayable and ugly <laughs> as hell. <laughs> Another one where save states in an external map. Uh-huh. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's the thing I want to like uh, put at the forefront before I say how this game can go f itself because I hate it. But like, <laughs> like the thing is, is like playing it even for five minutes. It's really impressive how detailed the sprites are. Like, especially if you went from Super Mario Land to this, the first game, where it was like splotchier versions of what the Nintendo game looked like. Like mm-hmm. this looks like Samus. This looks like the Metroids. This like the detail is insane, and the music also like for the kind of music that was on the Game Boy. Like, for the jump from Super Mario Land 1 to 2 is huge musically, and this game also is in between them. Like, the, 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 and then like the, the, the bone chilling silences that they used on the Game Boy 2, because mm-hmm. the Game Boy is typically always making noise, but this game utilized silence just as well. I think it's really impressive that even though it's on the Game Boy and even though it's limited, I had the opposite effect that you did, Dave, because I'm so familiar with the timeline. When it came out on an SO and I hadn't played in a long time and I booted it up, I went, oh, this actually looks better than I remember. Like, it's mm-hmm. more detailed than I remember, which was really interesting because I was expecting it. I, I had this memory of, like, older games and, like, the the more pixelated stuff, which this isn't. And they put a lot of work into readability and in a very sort of, I mean, a lot of NES era games, the second one is always a little bit of a weird offshoot, but that makes it easy to forget how often elements from it get integrated and you're just like oh that's always been there and Mm -hmm. this you know this was where the varia suit got the big shoulder pads that Mm -hmm. it's not it's not samus without big shoulder pads the Mm -hmm. gun opens to shoot missiles it's where any of those sort of choices like you did that because it was monochrome you know only missile doors needed to be shot open because that they couldn't differentiate them otherwise but all of those little choices also come through well which again it's the sort of thing where it's not a bad game at all. And it's not a poorly designed game. Quite the opposite. It's just a game of its time. Right. Yeah. I wanted to kind of point out some things about this game that I think, well, number one, made me bounce off of it the first time I tried it, uh, which mm. was kind of a half-assed attempt. I wasn't like going to sit down. I'm going to play Metroid 2. It was like, eh, I'll fuck around in this and see what it's all about. Uh, but I bounced off of it. And there's a couple of things I want to point out that I think – may give people that experience if you come to it for the first time in the modern day 
and um, you you know you you get blindsided by a couple of things. So number one, uh, the the camera is zoomed in more than other Metroid games. Samus takes up a bigger portion of the screen, mm-hmm. which means you can see less of what's going on around you. Uh, so I would be kind of like walking and then, oh, fuck, there's a Metroid like right in front of me. Mm-hmm. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about fighting the Metroids, but they're not easy, especially when you first start. When you find the first Metroid, you don't really know what the hell to do with it. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was a bit of an adjustment. Obviously, there's no color on the Game Boy. And when I played it, I played um, on the regular Game Boy filter on NSO. I only turned on the color when I got to like the last level. And I remembered that it has color filters for Game Boy stuff. So I oh. played in the monochrome um, color palette. And that really, uh, in my experience, led to me uh, not being able to mentally map this game in the slightest. Uh, everything looks the same to me. And so uh, it's really easy to get lost. And we'll talk about how you progress through these games. But uh I had a lot of trouble remembering where I was supposed to go to progress. So this was a game to play with a guide for me on the original Mm -hmm. game. Uh, The other two, we'll talk about that, not so much. But this one needed a guide, needed save states, as we've said before. Um, So there are some things about it, limitations of the hardware, that I think contribute to people not having a great time with the original game. Mm. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned a guide, though, because I think people downplay how much guides were important back in the day and it's not like yes. here's the official strategy guide here's an issue of nintendo power that has the map and has all of the big trouble rooms in it i still remember mm-hmm. that issue i definitely don't have it still but like that is how i got through the game back in the day because like nintendo power is was as much a part of being a nintendo fan back in the day as anything else like it yes. was part of this experience there i mean you're not wrong when you say that everything looks alike. There's a reason why all the future iterations upon it, like do whatever they can to sort of distinguish the different regions of the game mm-hmm. uh, in with different art styles to it. Um, and the argument you could make is that like the it is linear on purpose so that it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you there, can't there make are... a game like that non-linear. No one will finish right. it. Nope. I mean, it's still like it's zoomed in. Yes, it means you have a big sprite. It means that like when Metroid's like when you walk on a Metroid, it's sort of like they're pouncing on you, even though it's just a static thing until you arrive. And then that like Mm -hmm. really like um, both scary and monotonous, like boss music starts playing at the same time. And you're just like, Oh fuck, I have to deal with this thing. (laughs) Um, But it, yeah. I mean, like, like, again, giant rose tinted glasses on it, but I, I found it always so impressive what they were able to do with such limited hardware in terms of creating this sort of like, uh, kind of crazy environment that you have to like go into mm-hmm. yeah i am um, i before i i want to kick it to matt because matt you kind of wanted to get into why you didn't have a good time with the game i don't want to bury the lead here i actually like the first hour or so of this game so it took me five hours to play the first hour or so was a big adjustment as going back to a lot of like old retro games is for me personally uh, especially games that i didn't play when i was a kid but i did come to enjoy this game once I got my bearings, once I got a handle on how Samus controls. And again, once I booted up that guide, so I knew where to like, what direction to go in at the very least. Same. So I, uh, case has already said that like you have like the ultimate nostalgia for this game, Jeff, real quick. What, what's, what do you think about this game? Just in general, did you enjoy it? I did enjoy the game. I had a similar experience in terms of it did take a little bit of adjustment to kind of get the feel for what they wanted out of you. Mm -hmm. I did enjoy that they chose to make a big Samus sprite. Love the giant woman. Big sprite good kind of thing. (laughs) Because, again, it's that Super Mario Land thing where do you want to make a big stage or do you want to make a big sprite? And the big sprite is a good splash. It does allow for... The character looks like the box. It allows for all of those choices. It did make for some very silly times where Metroid 2 shares – well, Metroid 2 shares those sort of like very vertical traversal areas that Metroid 1 had because they can only do either vertical or horizontal scrolling. Game Boy didn't have that problem. But you would have those. But everything was zoomed in so much. So the last door, the bottom of the vertical things were never too close to the bottom. 
but they were always just out of the way of the camera seeing the bottom. So mm. I would do all of these leap of faiths to be like, all right, make sure to shoot down and fall three feet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no danger, nothing goes wrong, but I'm just like, of course it is. And that's yeah. fine. I, I, I do want this to pass over to Matt. I will say one thing about the zoomed in camera, which is that it is a Metroidvania by definition. And yeah. so there are no like death pits at the way that like there there are so exactly. many games like especially like all the super nintendo ports that hit the gba that where the zoomed in camera because of resolution and so forth is just like well you're fucked or like notoriously sonic 2 on the game gear where you Ugh. just you can't really play it because it's so zoomed in and jeff i know you were finally able to beat the boss and it have it not be an issue but <laughs> oh yeah no exactly it was fine and no it's there, and there's and you know what they actually utilize the zoomed in camera very well in certain situations and I want to talk about that once we're past the spoiler wall but yeah. the the space is at such a premium you don't realize what cramped spaces some of those fights are in some of those uh, encounters are in until you have like mm -hmm. a huge open room they do have a lot of fun with that and oddly enough I didn't have a ton of frustration with something being just off camera they utilize that fairly well there wasn't yeah there's it's a metroidvania there weren't a ton there's no instant death pits right and there weren't a terrible amount of gotcha moments because again you can only move at a certain speed so there wasn't like a sonic the hedgehog suddenly you're screwed and they utilize that well there's enough for, for all the crampedness there was an odd sense of space and like i said i wouldn't nest i would recommend it to someone if they have safe states in a map I also pulled up a map on my phone. It wouldn't, I wasn't yeah. like sitting there with like two screens going, but every time I was like, ah, where exactly am I? What's, what should I be looking for? I could refer to it. And that yeah. was perfect. All right. Take it away, Matt. <laughs> I mean, so I'm being a little harsh on this game. I do like it. I think my problem with it is in preparation for this episode, I didn't have the opportunity to sit down with a map. And like with my switch and like map it out, I ended up almost doing something like that with AM2R just to get through like the back half of it because I mm. got lost at a few points, not to any fault of the game, but because and this is, I think, an inherent problem with all of Metroid 2 is because of how it's designed where you have to kill a certain amount of Metroids, then a thing happens that opens up more. It happens mm -hmm. one way in two of the games and a different way in the third game. But ultimately, it's a lot of like kill enough metroids till a thing happens and then go back i would often f like forget oh wait where where was the last place i saw lava where do i have to go yep mm -hmm. and, and in the second game in, in the original game boy game i think it was i just looked at it and went i don't wanna and and that's <laughs> rare for me with with retro games um unlike you dave i grew up with a lot of these games and so like when i hit a wall with a retro game i'm like well how can i get around this can i save state my way through it i almost beat the first castlevania when it came to nso because i was able to save state myself to death almost like just through boss battles and through things until i safe stated myself into a corner which often happens especially at boss battles mm -hmm. and with this game i just didn't want to do that i'm confident that if i went back to it with a map open and played through it i could probably get through it i mean we've talked about this before dave but like the hardest games in this franchise like get to some of your favorite games difficulty like the dark souls games like metroid can give dark souls a run for its money on certain boss battles but i just always feel like i'm learning them in a way that i've learned to be patient with dark souls as well and i just didn't want to go through those hoops with this original version especially since i knew i was going to do it a little bit with am2r anyway um and so I kind of just watched a, a playthrough instead. But when watching the Let's Play, like, there were things that were really interesting. Like, I do like the flow of movement. It does feel like this in-between between Super Metroid and Metroid. But it feels like a, an in-between in the right direction. Like, yeah, yeah. Metroid mm -hmm. control. I, I think the worst Samus has ever controlled is in the first game. I think from two on, Samus is controlled good to great. Uh, and this game really set, like Jeff said, a lot of the tone for how the jumps work, how the spider ball works, how the missiles work. And those all felt familiar immediately. Um, but also the thing is about this game, I think that you have to remember and that I got frustrated with early on. You don't have to kill everything. There's no experience points. Like unless you're low on health, skip mm -hmm. enemies, jump over stuff, run past stuff. And I wasn't doing that. And I think that's also where I hit a wall. It's like I was trying to clear out full rooms and I was like, wait, why am I doing this? That's yeah. the opposite of what you're supposed to do in a Metroid game. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned the spider ball. I want to like point this out for people who are listening that never played this uh, or any version of Metroid 2. As far as I know, this is the only Metroid game with the spider ball. Yep. 
Yep. Which allows you to get in the morph ball and then climb up walls and ceilings and stuff. And it's fantastic. And after playing this, I, I played Metroid fusion for another podcast appearance. And I was like, where the fuck is my spider ball? I miss the spider ball so much. It's so cool to like be in this giant cavern and be like, I'm just going to spider ball my way up to the top of it. See what's up there. Especially because no matter what version of the game it is, the spider ball is not fast movement. Yeah. It is methodical movement. It's a very <laughs> just keep swimming kind of movement. Going to the top of a cavern is a commitment with the spider ball. Absolutely. <laughs> I will also say that the spider ball does appear in the Prime series as well. Because I played oh, the Prime okay. Remastered and uh, the spider ball is important to Metroid Prime. I haven't played Prime 2 or 3. I only played Prime for the first time this year when they released the remaster. But yeah, it's in the 3D Metroids as well. Oh, cool. Nice. Gotcha. Okay. I haven't played any of the Prime games since I rented the first one for a weekend uh, when I was a kid, and that's it. And I think the spider ball serves as the same kind of idea for both of those, whether 3D movement or small resolution. It's a nice solution. It's a nice catch for things. If you're not able to quite see where you're dropping or jumping, being able to press down while in morph ball and stick to the wall or a shoulder mm -hmm. button, as the case may be, makes those long falls a little less painful and a, the risk a little easier to take. Same goes for 3D movement in uh, the Prime games. And it, the slower speed could be said to increase anticipation as far as exploration goes. I both love and hate the fact that if you start pushing a direction and you move, you can just hold the button and it doesn't matter which way the spider ball is going, it will mm -hmm. go. I mm -hmm. think after having played through three versions of the game, I'd have rather slow had to push the direction i'm going yeah after a while i, yeah. I had wow. way more problems than th than saving moments with the way that they had it. it it's a really weird component of it where like yeah you're going right as a spider ball and then you start going up and then all of a sudden you get to a corner and all of a sudden you're going left but you're still holding the same button and um, if you take your <laughs> finger off the button for a second it resets right so you're yes. not like for whatever reason if you start pushing that again you're going in the other direction and that's usually when i'd get hit get knocked off the wall and if i'm on the ceiling that's real bad but also on on a lighter note the sound of rolling as a spider ball on the Game Boy version loved the little percussion beats that that ended up making. Mm -hmm. It was so fun. <laughs> and that matters. Yeah. And the, um, the, the spider ball is uh, really useful other than exploring too. Like if you're in a uh, room with a bunch of enemies on the ground and you don't want to fight them, just spider ball across the ceiling. Don't have to deal with anything. Uh, later, I can't remember if it's in the original game, but in the other games, um, the spider ball is very useful in boss fights uh, yeah. as a, a way to avoid attacks. And I do I do want to say also the spider ball is very useful in it's almost link between worlds on the 3DS style of it gets you thinking a little differently about what the actual environment is where you would have yeah. things mm -hmm. where, well, I can't jump past that. You're supposed to use the spider ball and yeah. go around the platform and underneath. And that shift in thinking was very fun. And I always felt like a genius whenever I figured it out. Yeah. Yeah. I, unlike I like it. the screw attack or like the, the space jump or whatever it is, the um, like it, it opens up this. Well, the screw attack is the actual attack part, but like the yeah. the element of it where it's opening up this whole space to you so early on because you get it so early mm -hmm. in the game. Um, It really I mean, like, look. As an original Game Boy game, and also again, just this game introduced saves, which wasn't in the first one. Like, this, right? Like, like <laughs> the, if you the had original told me that this was the original Metroid, Metroid. saves, we the Western gamers with the NES did not get saves. Right. Mm -hmm. If you had told me that this was the first Metroid, just like I'd be like, oh yeah, all the things that are part of Metroid are here. And then you like you show me Metroid One, and you're like, oh, all the things that I associate with Metroid aren't actually fucking in it. <laughs> like, Your shots or, don't even go all the way across the screen. <laughs> it's from the insane. Beginning. They don't even have <laughs> dental. Uh, <laughs> but it, it opens up like this three dimensional space or not three dimensional, but this, like this large approach to things, this exploratory element, like Matt pointed out that like, it's not like you don't get experience. You don't grind by killing things, but what you do grind is by exploring things. Like you, mm. you grind by like every single cavern you go into, you find every single nook and cranny where you're like a bomb might open up a, a missile tank right there. And that's mm -hmm. the way you beat this game because like. Most of the boss fights, to segue into what we're talking about with Metroid fighting, is let's figure out the right spot to shoot the Metroids from where we're going to take the minimum amount of damage 
and we're just going to unload as much as we have. Like there isn't a lot of strategy to the fight, but the strategy is going into it. How much did you explore? And when you're a six year old with a Game Boy and like you only own three games and maybe only brought one with you on this car ride, like that's the like all of a sudden it's super rewarding for that specific gameplay loop. It's a game of an era that just isn't around anymore. And I'm not saying that this game is something I wish that people want should play right now. Like Metroid 2, the original right. version, is such a product of its time that it is only if you really appreciate game design and only really appreciate what was possible at the time. And you have a lot of perspective on that. Should I recommend anyone to play it? Uh, but from the standpoint of living it at the time, it was incredible. <laughs> I also love those times you're doing the spider ball and there were plenty of hidden passageways that you didn't have to bomb. So you're just like chugging along the wall, the ceiling, then, oh, I'm in the oh, wall yeah, exactly. now. Where's yep. this going? Sometimes <laughs> yeah, it goes there, there's nowhere. There's a tile there, but like you can just like travel through it. And it was amazing. Like that's most of the actual health upgrades. Like, yeah, exactly. Way. So uh, kind of as Case brought up there, these Metroid boss fights are mm. the older style of metroid bosses where it is most i mean there's some skill to lining up your shots on the metroids because they're hit their hurt boxes are fairly small um especially because mm -hmm. they just fly at you in a straight line for the most part mm -hmm. but uh part of your strategy for the bosses in this and you know on to super metroid in my opinion um it's based on how many resources you've collected less than your skill at actually fighting the boss yeah uh, which is something that I'm not a big fan of. I hated fighting the Metroids in this game. I got fairly good at them by like Metroid number 30 or so, but mm -hmm. I cannot say that I enjoyed fighting them. And it's it's mostly because they move in such an erratic pattern. I mean, honestly, when they would get underneath me, the upward knockback was just enough, had just enough iframes that I would land on them again right when they wore off. And that always was a huge frustration point for me. Mm -hmm. There are several different types of Metroids that you fight, too. Uh, to my knowledge, I think there's three main types that you fight before four. you fight the final one. No, it's four. four. It's uh, four. it's Alpha, Gamma, uh, Zeta, Zeta, and Omega. And Omega, yeah. Yeah. That said, you don't need, like, they honestly could have just had Zeta and Omega be one type because there is yeah, very agreed. little actual difference yeah. in terms of it in this game specifically. And frankly, all four of them are... There, there's no real animation to them. They're just like floating around. And then there's like energy effects that occur from it. Um, but they just kind of lunge at you at sort of like random patterns. And the mm -hmm. Omega is the most dangerous because it has like the widest spread and the fastest movement. Yep. Yeah. They None of them were fun to fight. Not yep. a single one. No. Um, I can safely say that like we'll get to it in the other games. But I feel like none of the boss fights in any of these games were as fun as other Metroid games. I think... This is the worst of them, I think, for sure, especially oh, yeah. the later Metroids. The, the smaller... <laughs> well, wait, wait, wait. Again, Metroid 1. We, we, like, Zero well, well, Mission is definitely the of, definitive of way the to play twos. that. <laughs> yeah. Of the twos. Of the twos. Mm -hmm. Of the twos, yeah. Of the twos. Um, yeah. I think that the regular, like, muta the first mutated Metroid is fine. Like, it's just aiming up at an angle well enough while it's zooming at you to catch. But the other three after, like, it's just, it gets to a point where I am just running at them and hoping between the iframes and my erratic aiming, I will get them enough to kill them. Yeah, this was a game where I save stated in the middle of boss fights. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I'd yeah. be like, oh, I just hit that three times without getting hit myself. I am save stating right now because I'm not yes. going to start this fight over <laughs> from zero once I inevitably die. So for the advanced Metroid types, I definitely did that. Yeah, I, I'm yeah. the same way. I And then, like... Even when just traversing stuff, like I would, if I found extra missiles in a room, I would save state. Every time I found a health upgrade, I would save state. Like I just, I wasn't taking any chances. Well, there's, I mean, we said that you can actually save in this game. This game has save rooms, but they're not that many of them. No. Uh, later Metroid right. games add a lot more save rooms. So even if I was trying to play it the right way, uh, sometimes you'd be really fucking far from the last save room when you get into a fight against a Metroid. And I was just not going to play the like die and run back to the boss, uh, thing. I don't enjoy that in games, uh, that I really love, uh, the, the, the boss runs and stuff like that. So yeah, no. that was something where I was like, Oh, um, there's a Metroid shell. There's going to be one nearby save state. And then with those advanced ones, if I do well for a couple of seconds, save state. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I ended up at one of those Omega Metroid fights and I was at 20 missiles and had some health and had to do so much backtracking just to get more of them. Yeah. And yeah. it was we, we, we should note the missiles yeah. as like a, a, a as a mechanic, which is that the Metroids cannot be hurt by your shot aside from the missiles. Right. You uh, needed missiles. No, it wasn't yeah. like, oh, for every missile is worth like 20 shots of your beam. And so you really should have missiles. No missiles only. Yep. And uh, this game is kind of stingy with missiles unless you're going to grind enemies in the stingy environment. With drops. Yeah. In general. In general. That's mm-hmm. that's all you get. Uh, So the later games, which is something that I think is really nice, both of the remakes give you missile and health refills when you kill a Metroid, which uh, the original game does not. So sometimes you'll be like, oh, uh, I am in this area. There's like four Metroids to kill. I beat one, but I'm out of everything. So I got to go grind for stuff before I can go fight another one. And it would always be, I need to leave this room, come back in, kill the same guy, get whatever he's got, repeat. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Right, which was the style of the time. <laughs> yeah, I understand. And again, like you were saying, and as we're all kind of saying, yeah, no, it's of the time. These are yeah. the reasons why we're like, you don't need to go back, watch yeah. a Let's Play, or <laughs> no, this is what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. No- knowledge of these things. Yeah, I mean, like, because there's really interesting things in this game, but most of it is stuff that you can observe and sort of appreciate. Like, you brought up the Metroid shells. I think that's a mm-hmm. really cool element. Like, sure, yeah. it is a straightforward homage, again, to the Alien franchise with, like, the facehugger eggs. But it's so cool that we have this, like, the the symbol of the classic Metroid, like, broken open and, like, at spots so that you're aware that you're about to engage with a boss. Like, yeah. that's a really cool design element that they're putting that in there to, like – convey the story while you're in there Um, good environmental storytelling that's what metroid does exactly but i think that like this game really like is leaning into it because it has such a limited tool set for it all you know it it's such a weird game overall because it's like well it's a game where you're going to deal with a lot of the exact same bosses there's there's very few non like just metroid foes (laughs) like like you make sprites that big you got to make some cuts Mm mm-hmm well, and, and they're also dealing with, like, very limited memory. It's it's a tiny well, that's game. That's what I mean. Yeah, you, know, you can't – you only source so many graphics. Right, yeah. Um, but I think they do a really good job with having, like, this sort of environmental element. And as we kind of alluded to, as you get further into the game, there's less and less stuff that isn't Metroids because the Metroids kill everything around them. And it's very cool that we set up these environments that way. Yeah, I think uh, part of that it also plays into the music, something cool that mm-hmm. uh, you notice as you play – when you first land on the planet, there is a there's a, a theme song, like a heroic song playing. It's it's yeah. the song I led this kind of section with. Uh really catchy, um, you know, classic mm. Metroid style song. And then as you go through, you get less and less music. There are other places that have songs, but they're not as melodic as that first one. And then you go deeper and there is not music at all. There's just little blips and sound effects and stuff. As much atmospheric, you know ambient sound as the game boy could handle you know yeah and then as you go deeper sometimes there's no music whatsoever and silence is really effective for like the horror aspect that metroid sometimes leans into you know yeah well it's also because samus had a bluetooth connection to her ship playing the music right she got deeper (laughs) in there the connection got worse yeah and just when the album was going to get to the good part too I know, right. right? <laughs> I that's, curated the little this blips playlist. are like the little bits of connection between it. It's <laughs> oh, that's yeah. almost more frustrating. You're just like, I, I need to turn this off. Yeah, I, I, I'll say that probably the only thing that Metroid One does better than Two is the music. Right? Like there is, I think the ambiance of the NES was really interesting to put you in that kind of horror and unease. I think mm-hmm. this game does the best it can with the silence. The music itself, I feel like, is less memorable. I think the other two remakes do more with it, some to almost too much of a degree. Um, but I do love the SR388 Surface song. Like, it is an earworm. It's really catchy. Um, every version of it across all three games is is excellent. Um, yeah. But it, it, it does feel almost out of place because I feel like none of the other Metroid games really have that kind of – a theme this kind of bright and heroic, I feel like. Um but yeah, I think that you're right, Dave. I think that it does the best it can with the Game Boy sound. 
Um, and the silence, I think, is more effective than a lot of the sparse and moody music that's in it in a way that was, I'm sure, intentional. You know, when you enter a room and then there's suddenly just no sound except maybe mm -hmm. a creature is very unnerving in this game and was very effective when it happened. And yeah. I telegraphed well when it got to the Metroid music. Yep. Yeah. And especially because, as we were saying, like the really zoomed in ca camera, like oftentimes you would just be walking in a space with no sound and all of a sudden there's a Metroid there and y you get this, you know, this loud noise signaling the start of the encounter there. Um, and I think that's such a, a cool way, again, of this like predatory aspect of it all. Like you are you are tangling with these like apex predators and trying to convey that in such a, a, a limited tool set. Uh, one, uh, one thing I want to bring up with like the Metroid encounters, like despite the fact that objectively they don't do a lot, like they are four types of entities that do the exact same thing, which is fly at you with some energy effects going on, uh, draining your have, resources. Yes, but they do have some interesting stage layouts to sort of make up for it. Like I, I particularly think about the big fight with the Gamma where you're in sort mm -hmm. of like the sand pit and you have to like shoot out space just to move around as you fight it. Like mm -hmm. those are really cool uses of the level design to make up for the fact that like basically the whole game is fighting the same mini bosses. Yeah. yeah. That um, I'm glad you mentioned that like sudden spike of music, and it is like you said, like you're on a planet, you're taking out predators. So the fact that you barge into their lair suddenly, they jump out because again, you can't see that far ahead of you. It gives you that feeling that you're being ambushed a little bit, and the music does spike uh, when you see one, and it gives you that little like, oh fuck, there's one. But you know, Samus doesn't panic; she never panics. So, That's true. Uh, what do you, what do y'all say we uh, hit the spoiler? wall for this original game kind of talk about the final boss um some stuff at the end of the game maybe a little shop talk if we got it uh before getting into the next one Absolutely. sure sounds good yeah all right so this is your warning here if you haven't played metroid 2 for the game boy and you don't want to be spoiled on what's going on go down in the show notes you'll find a link uh not a link you'll find a timestamp for when the am2r discussion begins Let's, uh, before we talk about the final boss and the escape, is there anything, uh, any kind of shop talky type things we want to talk about? I would say that the, yeah, no, as the Metroids got bigger and as those mini bosses got bigger, they <laughs> really did get a lot more annoying in terms of, and their hitboxes got smaller. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. And cool. sometimes. No, and there, <laughs> and cases, as you pointed out, there was a couple of really cool, arenas in which to do it they did do a couple of interesting things but yeah mm -hmm. you know trying to grind to get more missiles to take out the last omega metroid was a huge pain in my ass yeah. but also the actual like setup for the final approach was kind of great as you i mean... mentioned the i mean the, the the last area even before the metroid count starts going back up Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Where, like, like I said, the zoomed in camera does create a claustrophobic feel, but that is the first time you're in an area where for any amount of time you see the walls the entire time. Mm -hmm. And I truly felt claustrophobic then. There weren't even any enemies, I think, in that area. Yeah. But it's, if right. they had done that the entire game, I'd have lost my mind. Are, are we back in the pod right now or are we is the, the shop talk like the out of. Oh, no, we're back. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, like, it's it's weird to have a spoiler warning on this one, because as, as we said, like, it sets up in Super Metroid, which is like a lot of people's entry point, or at least like the furthest back they'll willingly go. Yeah. Uh, where... I mean, honestly, if people are like, where do I start? Super Metroid. Yeah. You're fine. And Super Metroid starts with the last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy yeah. is at peace. <laughs> exactly. And there's... Even a, a graphical representation of the last Metroid hatching and being like, uh, mommy, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you mentioned, Jeff, before we do talk about the final boss and meeting the baby Metroid, that point when you, you think you've killed all the Metroids and you go into like their 
lair, basically. Mm -hmm. There's nothing else because, uh, as we've said, they've probably eaten everything else. No other um, life forms in there. And then that counter starts going up again. And suddenly the corridors, it's not just like one Metroid, maybe two in a room. Suddenly the corridors are full of them. And you have to fight through a bunch of them to get to the queen. Which was an unwelcome kick in the teeth when I thought I was almost done fighting those things. Well, especially because with way more aggressive tactics, because you need the ice beam to actually fight them in this one. Yeah, Yeah, it's the classic tactics for the larva. And I have to say, the way they placed the very first of the classic larva was absolutely heinous. I took more. (laughs) I took. I took more damage from that. How? What is your cursing policy on this show? Whatever, whatever comes to you. That Metroid took more of my fucking life than anything else yeah. I fought. <laughs> Even things that killed me. This Metroid fucked more of my life because it was the rotten approach angle. I need to be able to get it with the ice beam and then start getting it with missiles. It would unfreeze or it would just get me. I would have to use the bomb to shake it off. And by the time I'm upright, it's back on me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Second one. Yep. No fight. After yep. that, I was able to slowly approach, figure it out, whatever else. That first one. No. Fuck that guy. No, this yeah. part of the game had lasting trauma on me. Like when yes. in Super Smash Brothers, I think Brawl, when the trophy for the last Metroid um, is available or not the trophy, but like the assist trophy uh, mm-hmm. first shows up, whichever, whichever version of of, Metro, of uh, Smash Brothers where that shows up. I had a visceral reaction the first time it came out because of this situation where the Metroids mm. who up until this point, like the alphas are really fucking easy to fight, relatively speaking, especially they're by annoying, this point. In the they're game. easy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, like, at that point, yeah. The larval Metroids, the fact that you have to have this additional layer of strategy and the fact that they suck you dry, they don't just hurt you, they fucking drain your blood, is so goddamn terrifying. The panic and response. that, again, like 15 years later, playing Super Smash Brothers, I w- was having like reactions where people I was playing with were like, oh man, that really fucked with you. I'm like, yeah, man, fuck, man. <laughs> <laughs> the pig, it haunts me. Yeah, even though it's the good one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh so you eventually you make it through that section and you get to fight the Queen uh Metroid, which um I gotta say I figured out the regular Metroid fights. Uh if there was not the uh the clickbait, one simple trick that Metroid Queens don't want you to know to beat the final boss, I don't know if I would have beaten it. It was just very difficult. If I might have like crazy, you can do it because I there, didn't know the trick the first I, time. <laughs> I might have beaten her tonight after starting it over a month ago. Yeah. yeah. Kind of thing. So, yeah, no, I, I agree. It was. I also feel like this game signposts it the least because that kind of strategy doesn't exist in the entire game. Like, it's, it's all a cool strategy. It mm. is so cool. It's such a cool idea, especially I for know. a game so old. But, like, they never even hint at it. Like, all of the other Metroid fights. The the only layer is like the larva with the ice beam, but like the mm-hmm. regular ones, it's just find the right spot. And like, so you think yeah. that this boss battle, you're shooting it in the mouth, like, oh, that's the right spot. Its head's popping back. It's not mm-hmm. until like just trial and error practically that you get eaten and then can do the bomb. I think that this game is what inspired it being things like this being in almost every other Metroid game after having right. strategies like this for certain bosses. But like there was usually in a game like this, they like hint at it with something else. Nothing here. You just had to figure it out on your own. Yeah. yeah. So what we're referring to is the secret way to me, the only way to beat the final boss is to curl up in a ball and like roll up into its mouth, down its throat and then lay bombs in its stomach. Yeah. which it will hurt you while you're doing that, but it hurts you a whole hell of a lot less than actually fighting the boss straight up hurts you. And if you're able to get the shot into their mouth at the right time, it freezes her. Yeah, yeah. right. I So I, I was saying this when we were all like talking over each other. Um, when I was a kid, I didn't know this trick. So it is possible to win <laughs> without doing that because if you just grind every single missile tank in right. the entire game and have every single like E tank and you're good with the screw attack every time it spits fire and so forth at you. Yeah. Like you can like, it is possible to win that way, but yeah, it's really cool that it has that. And like, again, that, that that's pretty dope, but they, they don't set it up at all for it. It's incredible as an idea, like man, like to go down the throat of a, of a fucking dragon in yeah. space. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's an old enough game where it might've just been, Nah, man, this thing's got like a hundred hit points. One shot does one hit point. That's all you get. 
Yeah. Avoid the pattern. Good luck. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, it wouldn't be the first retro game to do something like that. You know, absolutely. (laughs) So it's uh, it's really cool to uh, to beat the final boss that way. And then you get to the um, the classic, uh, probably the thing that's most well known about this game is after you beat the Queen Metroid, you walk into the next room and there's an egg which hatches and the baby uh, thinks that you are its mom and imprints itself on you and follows you. And the entire tone of the game changes when this happens. The music yeah. be- becomes like the most peaceful, hopeful music that's ever been in a Metroid game. Um, there is no fighting on the way out. You just kind of like jump in, climb yeah. in out, way out of the planet. The baby Metroid gets rid of some obstacles that are in your way. And yeah. it's 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 one of a kind in the series, really. There's nothing else quite like it. Yeah. yeah. Unlike all the other Metroid games, it's not a race to escape kind of moment. Yeah, exactly. You're just yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of yeah. you're just kind of celebrating the fact that you have finished your mission. You've got this one. Uh, I remember as a kid being like deeply affectionate towards it. It felt like a puppy to me. Yeah, um, and yeah. you're just kind of <laughs> leaving as you're like grooving to like lo-fi beats to escape SR388 too. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a it's a it's a really chill kind of moment there. And like it's destroying all this stuff. And you're just like, yeah, I, yeah, I, I fucking murdered everything on this planet. I'm a hero. <laughs> well, and it also seems like another one of those good design choices or concessions to the Game Boy hardware. Could you imagine trying to do the like timed escape? I'm sure they could set it up, but it would either be super easy or super stressful, especially after dealing with that Metroid Queen. Like this mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. a really cool shift and change. And yeah, I loved it. Oh, you know, uh, you know they wouldn't have given you a chance to save after beating the Metroid Queen if there was no. an escape. So if you die yeah. during the escape, you're fighting that final boss again. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that would have been right in line with the designs of the time. And, yep. and, and I have to say, I like that choice here specifically as opposed to Metroid 1 and Super where this – like what, one thing we'll talk about when, when we talk about the the iterations upon this game – is that while there are temples, there's all these other elements of it, you are fighting a biological force in a space and theoretically you're in its nest. And like that kind of component of like, well, <laughs> fucking killed them all. Like there isn't anything else. <laughs> like you're now yeah. the apex predator. Like if, if anything, this is setting up the, like, the ultimate transform. Well, exactly. <laughs> this is setting up the transformation of Samus over the course of it in a way that like none of the successive games up until you get to fusion. Well, None of the successive. There's only one. But like like of the ones that like lead to the like the 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 fusion point between Samus and the Metroids, this is the one that sets that up the most. Yeah, Mm -hmm. nothing that comes out in the next 15 years. Right. (laughs) All those titles, all those Metroid games. But yeah. yeah. So that is Metroid 2. Let's take a little bit of music break. And when we come back, let's talk about AM2R. So AM2R, as we said at the beginning, stands for another Metroid 2 remake, and this came out in 2016. This is a fan game, um, and this is a really interesting one to talk about because uh, it's the first fan game I've talked about on the podcast. It might be the last fan game I talk about on the podcast unless I do an episode about fan games or something like that. This is a really substantial, uh, frankly, in my opinion, really excellent game that stands up with like the best Metroid games that Nintendo has done. So it really deserves its spot among the quote real Metroid two versions from Nintendo. A um, couple things I want to point out before getting into the discussion here, this uh, has been made to look and feel like the Game Boy Advance Metroids fusion and zero mission, uh, which means it is a lot more colorful. It's actually more colorful than the Game Boy Advance could handle as well. Mm -hmm. But very colorful game, uh, uses a similar control scheme. You have more than two buttons now. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of quality of life with how you get to your stuff. Uh, You can use the triggers to switch to your morph ball to turn on the spider ball. Um, You can also aim diagonally, which you could not do in the original game, uh, which is is always a 
it's rough to go back to just the two direction aiming in Metroid, but we're back to the uh, being able to shoot diagonally and um, just overall AM2R keeps the same. I want to say the important set pieces they've kept relatively the same. And there's a lot of other stuff about AM2R that's been blown up, uh, added to there's extra levels. There's extra lore added that the original game did not have. Um, there's more storytelling, like, you know, text storytelling, uh, and some liberties taken, uh, with all of that stuff, of course. So how did we all feel about AM2R? If I can start just because I want to get the only negative thing out of my system and then sure. move on from there. I think that this game controls really great, but it controls really great in the way that a well-made fan game controls. Playing Metroid Fusion right before this, I can tell that it is not made by Nintendo. It's not made by a professional game developer, unless this person is, and but only does it in their off time. The, the point I'm trying to make is it just feels slightly off. It's not bad to control, but I can mm. definitely tell the difference. And so that There's was a the looseness off. about it. Right. And so that's the only thing that threw me off the whole playthrough. But again, I'm also playing on an Xbox controller on the PC. So like, I I'm also taking that with a grain of th salt because it was never difficult to control, but it did sometimes feel like I was wrangling it a little bit. That said, it still controls as, gr as well as some of the best in its class. It is definitely trying to hit the Metroid Zero Mission, Metroid Fusion level, and it definitely comes really close. Um, but everything else that you said, Dave, like all of it is just an upgrade. Uh, and I, what I think is really interesting to start is that the, the original game is super linear. This game is not, it is, it is removed around to like feel like a, an SNES Metroid game, right? The Game Boy Advance Metroid games where there's backtracking, there's new areas, there's the power ups lead to getting to the new areas, which the original game did not really have. Yeah, I, I will, I guess I'll, I'll clarify there. So like your progression through the game is linear. It's the right. same kill Metroids, lava goes down, go into where the lava was. But there's backtracking. Um, they introduce a quasi fast travel system later in the game. So you can really comb back through the map in classic Metroidvania fashion. So you are right about that. Um, you kind of added like, <laughs> I, it's just funny that you call it quasi because it's like no i mean like you, you it is like beaming you around it's just using it, it like is a, you have to go to the places it's not like you can just teleport around the map but i guess yeah limited fast travel we'll call it. right yeah yeah how did uh how did you two feel case and uh jeff uh jeff you go <laughs> yeah no i'm on with the going into this with the understanding that yeah this was something that was in development for over 10 years mm -hmm. yeah. they started developing it not long after metroid zero mission came out and it shows i would say that sort of loose control that matt was alluding to that i agreed with is very similar to how metroid zero mission controlled yeah. so if nothing else this is this is a great fan game for all of the good and ill that fan games are fan games allow for explorations of mechanics and possibilities that you don't get in official games either because of design by committee or sense of balance or history or whatever else there's a you get a weird amount of we are going to change less and we are also going to change so much more it's telling that the save mechanism in am2r looks nearly identical to the one in for Return of Samus, because why change it? We're doing all of these other things. And there's all of that. It, in effect, is a very fun adventure. There's a lot of cool things to find. And there's also been a lot of speculation that the, the season and Desist came out when it did to allow for it to get a little bit of a release. And I'm thankful for that, regardless. Yeah, uh, what, uh, what Jeff's alluding to is that it, the Cease and Desist uh, came out the day after it hit the internet yes. um, so that it wasn't stopped mid production. It was very publicly in production for the entirety mm. of it. Of its run. And the reason why it was called another Metroid two remake is that there were a lot of them. Uh, zero mission inspired a lot of people to be like, this is so cool. The quality of life upgrades like zero mission is the, the definitive way to play the original Metroid game. Like there right. and no, and Nintendo wasn't going to do that with the second one. So we've got to do it. Well, and I mean, clearly they weren't going to for a long ass time. And like, so you get to that point. What I will say that I think is really interesting when we say, oh, it's a fan game. 
it it reminds me a lot of um homebrew in like TTRPG space where yes. there is an appreciation of the meta that is different than what necessarily the designers are doing but it is what we talk about like the like Matt's complaints about the differences between it and fusion I I hear but what I but what is very clear in terms of what they're going for is trying to appease the people who really love sequence breaks in Super Metroid. Like the wall jump is designed to be as abusable as it is in Super Metroid, but it's way harder to do than in Fusion. Like the, there's all these elements where they're like very clearly trying to make a game that uh, appeases the people who really love the franchise as a whole. And that yeah. kind of goes through everything about it. Like all the lore stuff, ev- everything there is someone who's like spent a lot of time thinking a lot about Metroid and thinking mm-hmm. about all the, all the, what the manuals say and all the, like the little bits of info and all the, like the crazy parts of it. And like trying to have as much and as like uh refined a version as you can of Metroid two. Like I, th- I, yeah. I brought this game specifically because it's, awesome like it's incredible from the perspective of like a per like of a fan game and like since it's come out there have been some patches um mm-hmm. there and not just the original patch that came out where they like nerfed the omegas uh but but since then there have been like much more like substantial ones like getting rid of art assets that were taken from um specifically zero mission but uh but from the metroid games in general uh mm-hmm. to make it much more of a, of a standalone product um but it, it's incredible from the standpoint of being a fan game where there's no chance of profit. And in fact, there's a lot of risk in, involved. Uh, yeah. just, there's just so much love poured into it and it's so slavish to details. And some of those details are like, well, how do we like split the difference between the super and the fusion wall jump? How, how do we split the difference between all these elements? How do we, how do we get all these things in there? Um, it <laughs> like, I can't think of a lot of games that would work this way for a thing that you couldn't make money on. Yeah, and I think you saying that like that, you know, that makes you realize that is the feeling of a fan game where you are your intended audience when you make a fan game is vastly different than when you're making a commercial game. You are not necessarily trying to draw in new fans. If you do, that's incidental. You are making something for the people who want this. They Mm -hmm. already wanted this. And thus you are able to have that huge attention to detail. You're able to have deeper cuts and slyer nods as it were and in the same way i actually wouldn't recommend this necessarily as a first metroid to people or as a first metroid 2 even i would recommend checking it out i would recommend playing it they do some really cool things but because of that no i I, i'm not necessarily sure it's the I know it's a little bit of a no, you can't play with it. You won't enjoy it on as many levels as I do, children, but (laughs) the colors, children. But there is a little bit of that. And this is, again, the good and the ill of a fan game. I'm not saying don't make fan games. I'm saying make fan games. But this is something that must be kept in mind. Yeah. It's funny that you say that, though. Like, I would say start with zero mission, frankly. Like the. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, we'll get more into it when we get into Samus Returns, but my hot take is that this is the the definitive way to play Metroid 2, specifically. Like, Samus Returns has a lot of really interesting stuff, but it is a different game. There's a lot of changes made to it that are, in some cases, are rewarding in some cases. But if you're looking at, like, the Metroid quadrilogy, like the the one through four of that we were getting of this like sprite based, like kind of super Nintendo game boy advanced kind of style. I think mm. this one slots in so well at like, if you played zero mission, this super Metroid and super Metroid has some quality of life stuff that is missing. Uh, that would have been great. It'd be great if someone made like a slightly upgraded version of Metro of super Metroid, but like <laughs> where you can like grab ledges and stuff, but I don't know how mm. much you would actually like be able to like really change. And then fusion like that quadrilogy is a really coherent, um, very like of a of a piece. Like the 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 aesthetics of it all like are are consistent amongst it. Um, the the story that they're telling works really well. The details that they put into here to sort of tie in between them all is really good. And I think that that creates a really solid like here's this like sprite based like Metroid series. And then mm. we get into the the later iterations that are coming out after that. Yeah, my only disagreement is the counter argument is that the uh, next game we're going to talk about slots in if you look at the actual five game run which is this narrative right yep including dread right 
Um, well, but, and, and then also Prime stuff like that, like right. But the Prime stuff is 3D between games. If we're talking about Metroid One, Two, Three, Four, and Five, that's these five games, including Dread. And yeah. so I have a different take. But we'll get to uh, that. But yeah, but we'll, I do we'll, agree. We'll get to it. I do agree with you, Case, though, that I think this is one of the easiest ways to play a classic Metroid game with almost zero investment other than owning a PC. Absolutely. And well, not do... even a PC. Again, there's an Android version. That's so true. like, yeah. like, holy yeah. hell, guys, like there is no excuse for not like just if you have an Android <laughs> game, if, if if you still for some reason have an Xperia play or if you bought a Retroid, like it's just like goddamn <laughs> loaded. If you have any <laughs> like if you can attach a controller or Bluetooth the controller to your Android phone because fuck iPhone like you're great. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I was going to say, I will speak for it is very annoying to me personally, and I know to a lot of other people, when you are getting games in a series or books in a series or something, and the format of one is wildly different than the others. You know, I had to try, like, even things like the Discworld novels, they all have to be the same kinds of paperback if mm-hmm. I can get them that way. Because if I get one in mm-hmm. hardcover, it feels weird. It feels incongruous. It, it, I don't like it. I'll accept it. I enjoy the content. I love the content. But I understand you know, why isn't the second one, the second Metroid, have a good sp- official sprite version? I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I do think that this game slots in, like we said, really well with Fusion and Zero Mission in particular. It it feels great to play. And of the three versions of Metroid 2 that we're talking about, I had by far the best time playing AM2R. The most fun, the least... Uh, I don't want to say friction because Samus Returns isn't that is isn't difficult, but Samus Returns is three times as long as AM2R is. So yep. like there is friction in that. Um, I had the best time just overall playing AM2R. Um, I didn't really notice anything with the movement that stood out as not fitting. You know, I played these. I played Fusion right after this. Um, felt fine to me. One thing I did note is that the space jump just fucking works in AM2R <laughs> yes. as opposed to many other Metroid games where it just works when it feels like working. It feels like the space jump in Metroid two on the game boy can needs to go sit at the edge of the dock and think about what it's done. Yeah, yeah it's bad. It's awful in yeah. fusion as well. And super Metroid, there's a bunch of movement stuff that just doesn't feel good uh, to me. Wall jumping, um, space jumping, Kind of sucks, and mm-hmm. everything just works in AM2R. So I think I appreciated it a lot on that level, as far as like movement and control is concerned. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I think I think how you play. I mean, we know this all, right? We all play have played games with a deadline for a podcast. Like how you play a game can affect how you feel about the game. And I will say that I think rushing through this in a week and a half. Mm-hmm. affected my love of it because i definitely hit walls with certain bosses um I, I i agree with your note here that this has some of the best like not metroid bosses like not you're fighting a type of metroid boss uh yes in the franchise yeah. it has extra mini bosses mini bosses but i i think they are some of the ones i struggled with the most and died the most on um, and that's just a Metroid game, right? You learn a little as you play and you keep dying and you figure out the mechanics and then you beat the boss. Um, but I think, cause it's funny, I, I, I think I'm going to have a very different opinion of Samus Returns than everyone else here on this call, but we'll see. But I do, I do want to, uh, uh, agree that between the colors, the music and the gameplay, this feels like it does fit right in with the GBA games. It's a bummer that I actually can't load it up onto my EverDrive for my Game Boy Advance SP. Cause I just, mm-hmm. with having, again, with having Zero Mission and Fusion already on there, it just for at least those three games, it fits, it feels like it's per, or, and, and then like those three games on the Game Boy Advance would play perfectly together, even in lieu of Super Metroid, which would be in between them. Um, and Steam Deck it is then. Steam Deck it is, right? For everything. Um, just download ROMs of everything. That solves every problem. But um, I will say the only other minor complaint I have, and we talked a little about this offline, is that the music is amped up here. And some of it is great. Like, I like the kind of electronic sci-fi style that a lot of the music takes. But we do lose any of the silence from the original game. Like, there are no pivotal moments of silence. And I feel like some of the music is amped up almost a little too much. 
like it's it's that complaint too much of a good thing right is that there really such a thing like i think all of it really yeah. works well for the game but i do think i miss some of those moments of silence or those moments of like eeriness i never felt like this so many other of the metroid games feel like horror games and i really never got that sense of horror except for some of the metroid battles but like there was no ambiance f- where the horror or dread came from mm-hmm yeah, it's interesting. Like, th- I, so I've listened to the AM2R soundtrack a lot. Um, but I actually haven't listened to it that much while playing the game. Um, like, I think that's also just kind of an element of like the modern world that we're in. Like, when do we actually have silence at all? Like, mm-hmm. I constantly have an earbud in playing a podcast or playing something, you know, like in one ear. Every, like, so even though like the music is like, I can hear the music of the game, like I constantly have other noise. Um, and I probably had the same, <laughs> when I was like playing, uh, like when I was playing Super Metroid and my sister would be watching the Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, like detective mystery musicals, <laughs> like, and there's a reason why when I think about Super Metroid, I can't help but think about like too much to do. There's too much to do because, you know, like your little sister can like destroy your brain sometimes <laughs> with mm-hmm. the stuff they're listening to. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just interesting where like I think about the first metro or about Metroid 2 and I could hum or give like some ver- approximation of every single song in that game. I can call to mind every single song in that and I have have a harder time with the arrangements of the of the two more recent iterations on that. Um like I can think about it and like with some effort like be like okay that's what that version sounds like and that's what that version sounds like but there's just so much more noise in life in general. And this just, it didn't phase me as much as I, I guess what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I kind of think like we, like we said, we talked about it before recording. I think the music sounds good, but there, you do lose just a little bit of that kind of eerie, even with the songs that have like a driving melody, a memorable melody, there is a more of like an electronic sound to it, which takes, I mean, it's sci-fi in a different way. I guess than like the 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 usual Metroid sci-fi soundtrack. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think this is the least ambient horror of the Metroid games, which isn't a bad thing, right? I I think that, but I think because of just the design and the want to pay homage and the way it's framed, uh, except for like the the, well, I guess we'll save it for the spoiler section. But there is a brutal fight scene later that is kind of taking liberties with a rescue team that like that felt really horrific Mm -hmm. in like an aliens way. But beyond Mm -hmm. that, like it mostly like, I'm just going to do the thing. I got to get through. Like, let's just play a Metroid game. Let's get through. You know, there was no fear in the same way. Well, I mean like as uh, like in terms of the actual like art style, I think there is great elements of that. Like there are a lot of fights in the dark that I thought were fantastic. Like there's, there's so many situations that you're dealing with in this game that I think the, the ambiance of the art direction is so good. And, like, the music is kind of just, like, an element of, like, well, what arrangement can you get? Like, which, what, like, like, this is, while it's one person putting it all together, there's, they're they're not creating it from scratch. And most of the more, most of the patches have been other people in the fan community updating it afterwards. Like, it is still a team project, even if it was one person grabbing art assets from here, grabbing music assets from here, and putting it all together into a shockingly coherent package. But it's still you know a disparate a yeah exactly like it like it kind of makes me think of like dragon ball z abridged where mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff that they're pulling from all these different sources and part of that because it is a fan production they don't have to worry quite so much and like that that's why the more recent patches that have removed some of those elements that are just like yeah no this is literally the sprite from fusion or this is literally the sprite from zero mission or this is a thing from super metroid like it's cool but it is still like we're assembling it all from all these assets. Yeah. Yeah. I can buy that. Uh, what one, uh, criticism I want to give toward this game for all the things that I think it improves. And I think generally across the board improvement over the original game, as far as like the play experience, mm-hmm. um, the Metroid fights I think are still terrible. They are awful. They suck. They're, really? they're butts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I got to the point where I, for at least the more evolved Metroids, I just run at them firing missiles and hoping like me bumping into them would bump them back into position because just standing still or trying to actually dodge them was less effective. And then the run of Metroids, the larva, 
Mm. Like, I hated that. I think it's better than the Game Boy game based on what I've seen, but it is definitely still just as obnoxious because they can drain you just as fast. Yeah, I, I didn't have any issues with that, that, you know, final part, but just the regular fights, you know, fighting one Metroid in a room, the upgraded versions, they're a little bit better than the Game Boy game, but I, I still would not. I, the added mini bosses, I will say that they put in this game are way better than the Metroid fights. They've and... improved the bubonic plague into malaria. <laughs> yes, we're uh, hoping for something slightly better in the next game, and we keep getting better until we just have the common cold. But yeah, like just, just <laughs> I'll take a light flu. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really just the same things that I didn't like about the Metroid fights in the original game. Their kind of unpredictability, the small hitboxes, I still felt that in this game too. And it feels like a, um, and this is different in Samus Returns, but AM2R feels like being a slave to the original game and the way the original game was and how those yeah. fights were in the original game, as opposed to making so many changes in other parts of AM2R for the better in a lot of ways. And then the Metroid fights are the same, but with better sprites and you have better movement, but still not a great boss fight experience for me, at least. No, it occurs to me that actually fighting Metroids in Return of Samus and even more so actually in AM2R because of the better sprites and movement, it reminds me of how it used to feel when I would fight bosses in old school beat em up games where mm. there's probably strategy here. But I'm just going to, like, try to wail on them and hope I survive. You yeah. know what? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because those mini bosses that they add in, those are from a newer school of boss design where you're mm -hmm. learning moves and avoiding attacks and countering when you have... environmental hazards that you're working with that you need to take into yeah. account. Yeah, attacking when you have safe places, uh, safe times to attack, um, and to the point where you... Maybe you fight this boss a couple of times, but the time you beat it, you might not get hit at all because you've learned it and mm -hmm. the attacks are avoidable. They are uh, telegraphed. So many ad like good advances in boss design through like video games from 1991 to 2016. Thank goodness. But then the Metroid fights feel like the old style where it's like they're just going to run at you. You're going to get hit a bunch of times. And, you know, if you get through one without getting hit, it feels it felt lucky more than skill to me. Yeah. The ultimate uh, strategy of the ultimate hunter. You don't <laughs> want to touch me. I'm yes. coming for you. <laughs> I, I mean, counterpoints on that. Like the, yeah, I, I think they do a really good job of utilizing scaling of similar threats. So like there's like later fights where you encounter multiple alphas, for example. I think mm -hmm. the, the speed for that. I mean, it's not a huge like breakthrough to be like oh yeah the armored carapace on the top should probably be invulnerable to missiles uh which was not in the original game you could fire you could hit them from any direction um but i i, I think they did a really good job of like using your mobility and faster metroid speeds like the the metroids in the original while they're fast they're fast from the standpoint of like it's a game boy game and they're it's a tiny screen and they're coming at you mm -hmm. um in this case like there is a lot of like dodging in play but it's dodging by way of jumping as opposed to like a dodge mechanism kind of thing um and then you get into things like the omega having like the weak spots on the back which are i i don't remember if that exists at all in the original but it definitely yes, is a, a is an actual mechanic in this one where it's like the the plate opens up and it's kind of like smog uh with like the, the gap and the goal on the bottom of his <laughs> of his stomach like it's like oh yeah, those are really cool things to like really try to implement now that said they are bestial they're not like when we get into samus returns there i think there's really interesting things going on with the way that they like structure those boss fights that uh, are of this sort of new newer school but those are moving into a newer type of game than what we're talking about with the zero mission treatment to Metroid two. Yeah. I mean, I think that ultimately the, the, the boss fights are easier here than they are in the original game. If only because you have better movement, you have super missiles, you have like other tools mm -hmm. that you didn't. So a few other tools that you didn't necessarily have in the original game. Um, mm -hmm. I will say though, that, I think the best parts of the game are the original bits. Like, I think Super Metroid, I think Metroid 2, while incredible for its time, is flawed in a lot of ways, which we've discussed before. 
but I think framing it around some new like the tower, for example, like case you were talking mm-hmm. about how environment gives you ambiance, the tower when all the power's off and you're crawling through and blowing up stuff to like crawl through because you can't use the doors, like all of that was great and felt like a modern Metroid game. Even there's stuff like that in Dread, even like. But then, and that boss also, you had to learn. He had the different firing ra- patterns, all of that, like felt better than almost anything that was Metroid 2 related. And I think it's because also there's an imagination of a fan who loves Metroid thinking about making a Metroid fight instead of reproducing Metroid fights from the second game. Um, I still don't like them, but. I see what you're saying, Case, and I and I can agree. But I do think that the proof of what Dave is saying is that the, all of the original stuff, the original puzzles, the original areas, all just feel felt better than everything else because it was original with this history of Metroid to build off of as well. And uh, maybe one of you can correct me if I'm, you know, regurgitating like bad rumors, but this. Um, this developer who made this game did get hired, I believe, by a AAA studio. Uh, maybe I think it's the one that the uh, makes the Ori games. If I if I remember remember that right. Oh, that sounds right. I don't remember the specifics, but yeah. So, I mean, there's there's obvious like game development chops, and it's uh, like Matt was saying in the original bits, you can see in the stuff that they changed. Yeah, he, he was a level developer or level designer for Ori 2. Yeah. yeah. So um, the the original bits here do showcase like a lot of let's let's just say we take out the parts that are copied from Metroid 2 and we kind of just focus on the original bits. I would love playing that Metroidvania, basically. Right. Yeah. And um, I think the the fact that they did get hired on to work on Ori 2 is a testament that uh, other people feel the same way, apparently. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of great stuff in here. Um, yeah. Is there anything else we want to mention before we get to the spoiler break for AM2R? This is sort of just like a weird thing. I didn't really expect to bring this up, but so as a fan game, th- sort of the goal of what you're doing is like both be a love letter and show off what your chops are on a platform that people actually pay attention to by virtue of the fact that it is a using an IP that people are familiar with. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And I have direct experience with that, especially currently in that I work in Star Trek fan films as a, as, as a hobby. Um, and currently I'm working on one that's doing like movie era Star Trek stuff. Uh, and it is really fascinating to see where like there's a lot of people doing like Star Trek fan stuff because it's really cheap because the stuff that was expensive in the sixties is not that difficult to replicate in the aughts and in the 2010s uh-huh. and the 2020s. <laughs> um, and, and it's really interesting to see like what the comparison point, um, where how do you tell a really cool story using the toolbox and using these things and being, um, slavish to details that you wouldn't have to be otherwise. Like Strange New Worlds is set in approximately the same period as the Star Trek series that I was doing, uh, Starship Farragut, but that can get away with being like, well, fuck it, whatever. It like, it looks cool and nice and good because it's, uh, uh, you know, updated like, filming styles and like updated abilities to do special effects and updated set design, all these elements versus like, well, (laughs) if we don't use a thing that looks exactly like that, like kind of abstract salt shaker that they used as a medical device, then it's not accurate to the screen kind of moments there. (laughs) Uh Uh, And and it's interesting to see like this one where like, they're really trying to like, look like the style of again, zero mission and super Metroid specifically. And then like some stuff from fusion, especially because fusion has like, um, SR388 like entities on, on the ship, even if they're using new versions of the sprite. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's really, it's, it's both restrictive, but also liberating in some ways. Like here's like a very narrow framework and you have to be very like attentive to those specific details and then show off like how well you can put pieces together, put in new puzzles, add new game elements, do, do all those things. Um, And it's cool to see how that is a, a bigger thing with like, fanfics that are specifically trying to be like of the type that is that world. Like obviously there's like other types of fanfics that are like, we don't care about the settings or we don't care about the relationships or all this, but it it's just such an impressive effort in the sense that like, if you had told me that Nintendo put this out as Metroid zero mission two, 
I wouldn't have batted an eye. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's a really good, um, good observation. And it, it kind of leads into like this general idea that I had that this feels like a Nintendo Metroid game to me. Um, Mm -hmm. especially because like I said, I I played this, I played Samus Returns, then I played Metroid Fusion all in the span of about a month. And this did not stick out in, there's a, a, there's one thing I'm going to bring up after this little mini spoiler break here that stuck out like a sore thumb and be like, Nintendo would have cut that shit. But uh, uh, for the most part, this did um, hold up to the quality that I hold a Nintendo game to. And like I said, not a surprise that this person got hired on to work on another great Metroidvania, uh, Ori 2. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's take our little spoiler break. We'll listen to some music. If you don't want to be spoiled on AM2R, Uh, Because there is some new stuff we're going to talk about aside from the, you know, remade spoiler stuff from Metroid 2. Again, check down in the show notes for when the Samus Returns discussion begins. And cue the music. So there's a lot of stuff added. So before we get to the final boss and the baby Metroid, there is some extra stuff that I want to talk about in AM2R. Um, The thing that I just mentioned that stuck out like a sore thumb is the part where you're playing as the robot. I thought that was terrible. And it was a very classic, uh, this is my game. I think this is cool. And I'm the person making the game. So it's staying in the game, you know, whereas if it was a collective experience of, you know, however many people at Nintendo work on a Metroid game or Mercury Steam working on the newer Metroid games. Uh, they might have looked at this and been like, hey, do we really need that robot bit? It's kind of weird. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. M64, that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it, it, I think it does stand out the most of anything that was in that didn't, because like you've never really done that kind of puzzle solving mm-hmm. in a Metroid game, but it didn't feel mm-hmm. so far in that I went, oh, I, why is this here? Yeah, uh, it, 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 was, it, it was frustrating, but it didn't feel completely foreign. It was kind of somewhere in between. It might have been trying to evoke a little bit of the zero suit sneaking stuff of yeah. zero of mission. Zero mission. Yeah. yeah. Right. Which was yeah. a proof of concept that you could go outside the suit, but uh, yeah. I don't know. It also kind of makes me think of like um, later 16 bit games like Yoshi Island, where mm. there's sections where you're like transformed into like vehicles and, and, and stuff like that, where it's just kind of here's a moment where we're going to just have a totally different control scheme kind of mini game mm-hmm. kind of element it's it's funny that it stuck out to you so much because like i kind of even forgot about it until you said it out loud because <laughs> it it was sort of like oh yeah i got through it pretty fast and then i kind of didn't think about well, it <laughs> i mean i didn't even write it in the notes when we started talking about you know the freedom that a fan creator has when making a fan game i started to think like oh wasn't it that robot bit where you <laughs> you're trying to like deliver bombs to places remote yeah, control yeah yeah, yeah mm-hmm. that was kind of weird wasn't it <laughs> yeah i mean i think to me also something that stood out in a good way that felt like an evolution of like the things we've seen in super metroid and even fusion was the moment where you come across the rescue team who's yes. going to help <laughs> you and then yeah. that's the first time you see the final evolution of the metroid to the final ver- the the last of the regular metroids that you fight and it like it like actually mutates in that scene and then rips them apart i thought that was really cool in a moment that then also became a routine metroid fight that you did a bunch of times after that Um, right but i did like the like that was when i was hinting at like things that happened that felt horror related besides the tower this was another moment where i was like oh no Oh God! I bet like my instinct was to run almost, and then wait, I'm Samus. Why am I running? Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of a thing. Yeah, and there is that little bit of I think all of the Metroid Two versions have their bits and pieces of okay, this started as something really cool, and whether it's by the second or third time, or even three seconds after it started, it kind of goes and uh, and I, <laughs> you know, those things that become like. Oh, this is a really cool thing to do with the Metroid fights. Unfortunately, you are still saddled with fighting the Metroids. Yeah. You know, yeah. throwing six Alpha Metroids at me is still just making me fight Alpha Metroids. Yeah. yeah. Right. And same with this bit where the scientist 
you know, gets ripped apart. It's a cool intro to the same fight that you're going to repeat and that you've already done in the original game. If you're like me and you're playing all of these in order, you know, <laughs> right. it's, it's great that they only yeah. do it the once. Like if it's yeah. a, you know, having to watch a Metroid evolve from one form to the next before every fight on the Game Boy version wasn't like debilitating or untenable or anything, but it did get a little old. So they, they, there's at least like a cinematic thing. You're just getting that once. Cool. Mm-hmm. Thanks. I'll f- you know, even to the point where you get the missile tanks and you you just have to scroll through that once. Yeah. Yeah. No, like the game does a really good job of like fleshing out the lore in really like uh, cohesive, coherent ways that rewards you. Like the first time when you like find the, the research team and like there's an alpha there. And you're like, oh, that's what fucking happened to them. Like, I think it's a really yeah. cool kind of moment there. And like likewise, yeah. when you actually get to like the much more armored kind of Marines and it's like, oh, 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 they actually were able to like survive for a while. But this thing they can't fucking deal with. Like, mm-hmm. though, those are really cool, diegetic uh, storytelling moments that are in the manual, but are not in the original Metroid game. And mm-hmm. it's really it's really well done there. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there's a reason why the hunt down every Metroid kind of format isn't the rest of the games um, yeah. and why that isn't par- that why that's not a staple of the Metroid Vania genre, because mm-hmm. it's just not how those games are really work best. It's how you can make yeah. it work on the original Game Boy. And right. then we are now attached to that in all future iterations. Right. Which yeah. I don't mind for this one game and, and no. its successive iterations. Like the craziest part, the fact that we're talking about three games right now for the fact that we're, that it's the one Game Boy spinoff. Like, can you imagine us having this conversation about like Castlevania Adventures? <laughs> like, the, <laughs> like not many games have had so much love and like that one did have a remake, though. Well, but but what I'm saying is like the amount of like evolution and like the fact that. There, there's such different viewpoints on like, well, what is the evolution? What is the right way to play this game? Mm-hmm. Is it, so cool and 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 interesting, and it's such a sidestep from the original. And it's interesting, you know, we're like, we got a couple more things to talk about, but it's interesting when we talk, you know, the the remake by the fan versus the remake by Nintendo, and the things that both of them prioritized. Absolutely. Right? Because they did prioritize different things. So uh, one, a couple, well, I guess talk about the final boss and the baby Metroid. Um, one thing that I thought was like just very cool, like like did a fist bump when I was playing it, is during the final boss fight, which has changed. Um, it is a multi-stage. Uh, you fight the boss for a while. It destroys the wall. You get pushed back to the next wall. You fight the boss for a while. It goes on for a bit too long, but it's a bit more skill-based. It felt a bit more skill-based or at least easier to grok than the original uh, fight against the Queen Metroid. Um, And then there's a set piece at the end of that fight where you do the the skip from the original game where it swallows you and then you lay bombs in its stomach and that's how you kill it. But it's in it it's um, basically a cutscene, an interactive cutscene in AM2R. Um, and I thought that that was a really cool tribute to a very cool thing from the original game, uh, to not like make it an option in the fight to make it a part of the fight, uh, a more cinematic part of the fight. And, you know, a remake should kind of pay homage to the really memorable stuff from the original game, right? It doesn't really matter like what you're doing with a remake, (laughs) but, the really memorable stuff, the the awesome set pieces should be included somehow, right? And I think this is a cool way to include that that well, bit well, where you go in the stomach, men in well, black. <laughs> yeah, right. Wanted to get your gun, huh? Yeah. Well, what's really funny is it's not just an homage to the original Metroid 2. It's also an homage to Metroid Other M. Ooh, because I did not play that. Because I did not either, but this is information I got in my research and then followed it up. Uh, the idea that you do fight a cloned Metroid Queen in Metroid Other M. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. anybody who was really chomping at the bit to play Metroid Other M. I've right. spoiled it for you. <laughs> it well, let's be sled. honest. We all know that what needs to happen is another Metroid Other M remake. Another yes. M. <laughs> so so in, in the, the first Other M, the pre-Nother M, 
there is a fight with a clone Metroid Queen and it is a cinematic and you finish it off with a power bomb into the stomach. And so it is wonderfully serendipitous and delightful that, yeah, no, you get to pay homage to the strategy from the original while also kind of tying it into 3D Metroid stuff, which will come up more later. Yeah. And also, I think what's really interesting about this fight is it this is also where the horror moments are at their height. Right. When Mm -hmm. you go down that hallway fighting the larva in this game, there's a sense of dread and overwhelm. And then when you get to that final room before dropping down, the music gets is just different. It's eerie. Mm. And then you drop down and this Metroid Queen is bigger, obviously, because the sprites are just set up different. And in this, she's bashing through the walls behind you as you kind of are on your heels the whole fight until you're backed into your final corner. And then you're like, I've got this. And it's that cinematic moment. I think the set pieces overall of this fight is the second best version of this. I am more on that in a minute, but I think it's a great version overall because it just takes the kind of feeling of the original game and then kind of makes it more cinematic using the kinds of things that fusion and zero had done that inspired this. Yeah. It also works mm-hmm. with like the fanon of like, well, what is the like acid or lava or whatever situation that's going on with everything? Oh, it's the planet's acid reflux. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like the idea that the queen itself is like kind of disrupting the environment around and the fact that in this fight, the queen is like breaking through walls and, and destroying things kind of feels like the, the, the idea that as you're like killing her children, like she's like breaking, like she's like literally like ripping plates apart within her rage. Um, that sort of explains like the, the acid sort of explanation at, again, this is fan I- ideology of trying to like explain it because it's, it was a game mechanic in the original that like was never explained. And mm-hmm. for me, like little seven year old trying to play this game, uh, I, there were plenty of times where I was like, I wonder how far I can go. Like, I wonder if there is like a space you can get to on the other side of all this acid. Uh, in this weird exploratory game, or maybe I should at least like map out what is in there, uh, between save points that, you know, d- doesn't make sense in retrospect because like we all know, like, oh, it's a gated area that like burns you to death. But like when the first time you're playing this game and it's like a weird like exploration game, who, wh- wh- you're gonna what's weirdly up with explore. That? Yeah. We, we, ex- explore in a weird way. You have a lot of health and it's not killing you immediately. So yeah, yeah, check it out. See, see if there's something there. And this game, at least like, kind of keeps the sort of like well, what the fuck but like provides like clues but the clues are like based on like what fans kind of articulated before as opposed to like very like rigid rules that we'll talk about in the next one it's fair no honestly i feel like this is one of this is my favorite explanation for the impassable liquid mm-hmm. <laughs> for for sr 388's heartburn and uh once you have I don't know, chucked a big Pepto-Bismol into the core of the planet. Uh, You get that scene with the baby Metroid again. This one is like uh, less remarkable than the one in Samus Returns as far as like comparing it to the original. It's, I think, very faithful to the original game. It's still peaceful music. It's still this hopeful. It's not quite like Victory March. I just killed all of your brethren, a young child. But it is still like this peaceful, hopeful um music playing as you escape with no uh, combat or anything like that. It's just a kind of victory lap. I'm glad that Case brought up in the earlier game that unlike most other Metroid games, it doesn't end with a frantic timer or escape sequence or both. Um, It's just kind of like you got the baby and we're going to make our way peacefully off of the planet and all is well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Galaxy is at peace. Yeah. Yep. And it ends on that perfect line. Like, it's so, it fits so well in that perspective. Until Metroid Fusion. <laughs> so uh, that is AM2R, and we're going to take a little music break. When we come back, it is time to get into the official remake, Samus Returns. So, 
Metroid Samus Returns, once again uh, released by Nintendo, developed by Mercury Steam for the 3DS in 2017. Um, And when I picked this game up, I was amazed by how much this does not feel like Metroid Fusion or Metroid Zero Mission. This feels like Metroid Dread uh, in lots of ways. I obviously came out before Metroid Dread, but a lot of the stuff that is key in Dread is here. Uh, The parry mechanic is front and center in this game. Lots of enemies will rush at you with a big uh, like flash of light indicator. You can parry them. You can parry just about any enemy that charges at you, and most of them will charge at you. So I want to camp out on the parry mechanic for a minute, but I also want to mention the other big mechanical change in this is that you can shoot in any uh, at any angle omnidirectional aiming not just front uh not just up down side and diagonal and um this takes a little bit of getting used to but uh, especially with that 3ds thumbstick that i despise <laughs> but oh yeah let's uh let's talk about this um mostly the parry because this is the big thing that was introduced in this game and it is a major mandatory part of most combat encounters in my mm-hmm. opinion So when Super Metroid came out, I really dreamed of a sequel on Super Nintendo where Samus had some kind of melee attack. I always thought that that would make a lot of sense. Um, I really envisioned a kick kind of effect. Um, Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's it's like this uppercut is like it it, is fine Um, with the cannon. Yeah, like no, it, it makes an, it makes enough sense. Uh, in our chat, I had like said like, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you were holding a charge? If that charge had did something, the way that in like Super Metroid, if you're holding a charge and you cartwheel into someone or like you you uh, uh, somersault into someone, uh, that it like does damage to them as if they'd been hit by the charge beam, like would have mm-hmm. been really cool." Um, I have really mixed feelings about the counter. I, in terms of being this specific game, I haven't played Dread yet. I really want to play Dread. I could see how a game built from the ground up with the mechanic in mind would make a lot of sense in this one where you're kind of not you're kind of you're you're in a natural environment that has been overtaken by animals that they all charge at you in really choreographed ways that you then counter uh feels weird even though the counter itself is cool yes it feels very cool to pull off the first dozen times but but especially like all, all these goddamn animals where it's like, why are they charging you that way? Like, it's one thing if they're like, you're approaching them and they attack you kind of thing, but they mm-hmm. all kind of attack in the same kind of choreographed ways that it's a little frustrating that it's such a core part. And I know you can do a run without using the counter at all. I know you can get around it. It's fine. By the end of the game, you don't really use it as much just because it's fun for bosses. Yeah. But it's just such <laughs> like, it's such a game mechanic. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, I think, the big thing about this particular version of Metroid 2. It feels the most like a video game as opposed to the most like a a search through a a, a abandoned planet. Yeah, I love the parry mechanic. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I agree that it's overused here in a way that I felt was more natural and dread. I think, yes, yes. unfortunately for you, Case, and this is to no fault of your own, you're missing a chunk of the picture by not having playing dread because this absolutely, in its completion, is a demo for Metroid Dread. Like, yes, this game no, I, is I get that. Deeply. It, it, it's deeply a proof of concept and that I think this paired with dread is a, uh, is a clearer picture than it in an isolation. But I will agree that by the end of the game, parrying regular enemies is not necessary and also obnoxious. Um, but I think it always works in the boss battles. And I like how mm-hmm. cinematic the boss battles are in this game mm-hmm. in a way that they weren't. I think these are the best boss battles of the three games for a lot of that. But Ooh. I yeah. do, before yeah. I go in on that, I want to say the best thing about this game that it has over both versions is the, the bottom screen where you could see a map all the time. Let me yes. tell you, when I played this game and I had that and then went to Dread, because I think I said this at the top of the episode, but I bought this a few when Dread was announced at the Nintendo Direct over the summer. I then bought this game on the eShop and went on vacation and played it over the course of that vacation, excited for Dread. So I think I have rose colored glasses on this game because I was excited this company was making Metroid Dread and I had already played the Castlevania game they did for 
3DS, the PC port of it. And so I was high mm. on Mercury Steam and excited. But having a map that you can just look down at, that you don't have to pause the game to look at, changed Metroid games for me. Like, the mm. fact that when I got to Dread and I had to pause the game again to see the map, it wasn't that inconvenient. But it was also like, ugh. I love you know how much better screen. it can be. Right. Yeah, exactly. You've <laughs> you've seen how good life can be. Yeah. Well, yeah. especially when you get the scan pulse aeon ability pretty early on and you're able to just kind of, well, let me check the map. Hit the button. Love yeah. that. So much yeah. faster than the x-ray beam. It doesn't give you all of the answers, but you still feel cool and exploratory while you do it. <laughs> and it's it's somewhat limited, you know, this this game introduces those um those abilities and you have a a magic meter of sorts mm-hmm. uh, to yeah. use those. And the scan is one of those. You can't just use the scan forever. Uh, you'll run out of uh, the energy. You have to go get more. Um, luckily, enemies in this game are very generous with dropping health and refills to that energy. So it's not really like a big deal. But there are, um, there's other, you know, abilities. There's one where you freeze time so you can get through, um, uh, stuff that crumbles too quickly to walk across. Um, there is. I kind of like that as the ch- as the difference of the speed boost. It was fun. You know, mm-hmm. you either speed up or slow down time. I like slowing down time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Matt mentioned the bosses. I think that this Samus Returns has by far the best boss fights of, uh, with one notable exception, hmm. of these three games we're talking about tonight. And I'll go further in saying that other than Metroid Dread, this has the best boss fights in any Metroid game that I've played. Hmm. I've not played the Prime games, and I have not played other M. But uh, yeah, Super, both Game Boy Advance games, this game has the best boss fights for what I want, which is a skill-based approach to boss fights. Um, The Hmm. Metroids in this game are so much better to fight even if some of them take too long, in my opinion, because yes. yeah. there's a bunch of them that'll like leave the boss arena oh and my you have God, to go chase them goddamn down. Damn fucking gammas. Like, and I hate that you it's... cannot damage them while they're leaving the stage. They're cinematic. Yeah. They're, they start the motion and it doesn't matter. Yep. The plot and, armor comes on while they're yep. escaping. Yeah. Also, those goddamn sections where they're at, because like they have like sections where you're like, oh, well, you can hide away from them. But like the game does not require that. Maybe in hard mode, but, which I did not play. Um, right. yeah. But like where you like, I don't have the amiibo there. there there's yeah. all these like extra chambers that I'm like, why is this here? And then also they fucking run away from you. And I, I know that there is a way to kill them in one shot. <laughs> like, but, yeah. but yeah, like, oh, Most my God, people aren't going to kill them in one shot. Most people's mm-hmm. experience is going to do it the way that it's been designed, where you fight them, they run away, you fight them, they might run away again, and then maybe the third or fourth room, you get to finally finish the fight. Well, especially because yeah. the circumstances don't change when you do. Like, it'd be one thing if it moved to a room that had lots of acid, but all the all the rooms are just, like, similar kind of big chambers where you fight mm-hmm. them, and that's sort of it. Like, it'd be really interesting if there were, like, dynamically different environments between each of the rooms, but they're all, like vaguely similar based on like the section of the map that you encounter them at and it's right and if i didn't so have the map annoying. on the screen i would so get lost in those yeah, yeah. also also true because like because like I, like i came across like the empty chamber first for most of these fights and i was like oh okay yeah. i guess i'm gonna fight them later here because i'm gonna find the room that they're actually in it, it was just needless padding in terms of the actual like fights for those ones because there wasn't more going on with them and that's i'm glad you brought that up because that was um i found the parry to be uh, the counter to to get old after a while, just as everyone has basically said. But my biggest issue and the reason why this was my least favorite of the three is that this game's way too fucking long. It's three times as long as the other games, and it's it a lot of it felt like padding, uh, like Case said, those boss fights. But the the biggest thing to me is it's still following this: go to this area of the map, kill this number of Metroids. You plug them into a Metroid DNA locking mechanism, which then mm-hmm. lowers the acid, which is uh, that feels extremely video gamey in a way that none of the other games felt. But the big thing is that these map sections, even if there's only three or four Metroids, they're like three times the size of even the ones in AM2R. Mm-hmm. So you spend so much more time going through these these sections of the map and It's not like these are blown up and then full of super interesting stuff to do in the meantime. It's just more corridors with more enemies to counter. And 
it really grated on me. It felt extremely bloated. Yeah. I mean, and it's funny. I agree. I do think this is much longer than it needed to be. But I Mm. think the reason that that didn't bother me is because I had, we like swapped, like how I felt about AM2R playing it for this podcast and rushing through it. I didn't have this experience with this game a couple years ago because I bought it right before I went on vacation. I'd play like an hour here, an hour there over the course of a week and like nine days. It didn't feel that padded until like the last few hours when like it's really getting annoying and the Metroids are running and like that whole like tail end of the game did i started to feel the length i'm like i want to be done but most of the way through i didn't really feel the length because i was not playing it in large chunks i was playing it like kind of as i picked up my ds um Mm -hmm. but i but i will agree that by the time i got to the end i was like i want to be done like yeah i don't want to run back again i don't want to go back to like at least they give you like the thing we haven't said is they give you teleporters in this game so there are save points there are recharge stations and then there are also teleporters that let you teleport between certain parts of the map and so going back isn't as tedious but it still did feel somewhat tedious and they knew that which is why they gave you the teleporters but they all still have a little tiny cinema cinematic that plays while you do it while you yeah you know dramatically shove your cannon into the into the refresh station while you you know sway your way into the teleporter while you whatever else and those add up to hours and something else that was as far as the backtracking goes i don't know how i feel about this but a lot of the tank upgrades, whether energy tank, Aeon tank, missile tank, and and the like, a bunch of them are kind of hidden in these really cool little secret areas. And by that, I mean, it's almost like their own little puzzle platformer piece all on its own, easy to get to, but to get to the thing, you've got to find and figure it out and get through the works. It reminded me of like sections of Guacamelee in doing that if you've played Mm. through that but most of the time and like i would play an entire game of those sorts of puzzles it was super cool yes anyone who is familiar with the side quest series that was the second episode you espousing the love of guacamole (laughs) exactly guacamole too in fact now the thing is and i would i would play I, I actually, my notes, I was like, I would play through an entire game, an extra mode of Metroid Maker puzzles, because that's what it is. It's Metroid yeah. Maker. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you for saying that part. Uh, co- finish. But I have a thing. And but the thing is, I'm finding these while I am backtracking and trying to 100 percent the game. And I am not in the mood for how clever you're being right now, Mercury Steam. I have <laughs> shit to do. And. If it worked its way through or if it was its own little thing, it's context. Like, again, if I'm just going and taking these challenges, let's go. I love this. But it's just that's where it felt like padding. It's like, oh, you've given me a cute, cool challenge. I like that. I just at this point, I will tear creation down to get this stupid power bomb upgrade. How much am I getting? Another power bomb? One more power bomb? Fine. (laughs) But I'll do it. And that's kind of where I had a bit of a, like I said, I don't know where this falls in pro and con, but it's notable. So saying like a Metroid maker is exactly what my note about this game was. Uh, Mm. If you had asked me which of the two remakes was the fan remake, I honestly would say this, but in terms of the general style of it all, it made me think a lot about when Warcraft 3 came out. People made full remakes of Warcraft 1 using the Warcraft 3 engine. And the engine itself is a better engine. Everything about it, the assets are better. But we're taking very, very, like, extremely modern concepts and applying it to a much older game format. Um, and, like, like, obviously the combat engine is great. I love the innovative use of things, like the, the grapple beam, for example. Like, fucking yes. amazing stuff mm-hmm. going on when you get to use it. that in a boss battle it's always incredible it always yep. felt good just just fantastic stuff going on there but it gets down to the fact that like the levels are in a lot of cases like abstracted from the original basic format kind of just for the sake of like either adding extra rooms or changing kind of the shape of a lot of them in just to be a little bit different um or or in, in some cases to utilize the the new abilities which are are great but you can see that this is them working out dread like yes. when you're playing it, e- even even if you didn't know dread was coming, you can feel like, oh, they're working out the engine for the next game. 
And yeah. I, I like the engine a lot and I can't wait to play Dread because it's so cool, but it is a different engine than the earlier ones. And AM2R feels like we're using the same engine as Super Fusion Zero Mission and like working it out and like, Sure, there's idiosyncrasies between them all, uh, in terms of like all the physics of it, but like Samus does not move the way Samus moves in the previous games. Samus shoots at a different rate. Samus has the, the melee. Sam, like there's all these things about it that felt like you're kit bashing or like doing a level editor from the Dread engine and being like, well, could I make Metroid 2 with a level editor that Dread came shipped with the way that yeah. like all these mm. PC games I loved back in the day? did you know the 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 way that like dota came from um uh was it starcraft initially and then warcraft 3 is where it was like cemented like where like you can make these like you know emergent gameplay (laughs) from Mm. from the the stuff that's provided as tools in the game this felt like that um and i I like it but it's yeah I would like to point out that Super Fusion Zero Mission is absolutely a Mega Man X fan game somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, when you were listing them off, I'm like, if you just take Metroid out of all of these games, that is just, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Like, I like this game a lot. Starting to play it, I was like, there are so many things I really enjoy about it, but there are a lot of elements in this game that frustrate the hell out of me for a Metroid 2 specific game. Like, right. if you told me this was a bonus pack that came with Metroid Dread that you get to play through effectively Metroid 2, or it's a new game, but it's in the style of Metroid 2, I'd be like, this is really fucking dope. Um, but like every time I came across a door, every time I came across an elevator, every time I came across all these things yeah. that are part of the Metroid canon as a whole and like the Metroid game design as a whole, it's just a different game and it's a different kind of thing. Like Metroid 2 has this, this one, and again, I understand massive rose tinted glasses for this specific one but it is the only one where we're not dealing with space pirates we're not dealing with a lot of like the only things that are technological are the things left over from an abandoned race as opposed to this is an active base being used for all these kind of things like Mm -hmm. it's a thing i love about fusion that it has a deliberately different design from the uh, other metroid games Mm -hmm. and this one Samus Returns specifically makes it feel more like a generic Metroid game, but with this new engine. And I like the new engine, and I'm shocked that I like the new engine, because usually, like, two-dimensional but polygon-based gameplay annoys the hell out of me. Like, it's floatier, the the fire rate is different, there's a bunch of things that are just different from normal Metroid games, but they do a really good job of, like, having it feel cool. Like, it, it, it feels really good. Uh, I, I really enjoy... All of that in a way that like Mega Man X8 is just a game that like I understand it. Oh yeah, but this is apples and oranges. If you're going to bring up Mega Man X8, well, but compare. I mean, like AM2R feels like X as as opposed to the original. Like the the hitbox is the same, the the run rate's the same. There's like all these things are similar. Right. Like this, Jeff. I I know you're going to understand how I say this. Like AM2R feels like Mega Man X to the original Mega Man. This feels like super castlevania to the original castlevania like in terms of there are all these new tools there are all these new mechanics but it is not a game that was built around that they have just modified it to be built around all these new things and it's cool and you can see how when they can do it from scratch it is one of the best games in the series yeah Uh, but here it's just like it's still great it's just like these like niggling little bits of like it's a new game paced the same as an old one and inherits old problems but doesn't have the same nostalgia and doesn't have the same feel so it's like it's just like this weird hybrid of it all i think it, you hit it on, really is yeah i think you hit on something for me really quick dave um i think i know why i enjoyed this the most because besides fooling around with metroid 2 back in the day this is the first time i played metroid 2 was this i played am2r yeah. after i played metroid 2 at length after and so I think because this is my first experience with Metroid 2 in excitement for Metroid Dread, I thought this was a pretty complete experience and that the flaws more came to light as I thought about it more and as I, of course, played Dread and went back and played older games. Mm-hmm. And I played this before I played AM2R. So I'm comparing AM2R to my already solidified experiences with Samus Returns as opposed to vice versa. Yeah, and I played them in release order. So yeah. I played this last, 
Um, so the, I guess like the differences in the way that this is built really stand out. And I, I think case mm-hmm. made a really good point when this does feel like, like half in Metroid two and half in the future of the Metroid series, but the Metroid two part doesn't quite jive with the future of the Metroid series. The fact that it is built around go to this area, kill three Metroids. Um, but we want to do some like cool new stuff. So we're going to like build up this area and give you tons of places to explore, but it's really big and there's only two Metroids in here. So you're going to spend a bunch of time, like not really making progress toward moving along in the story, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's a couple other like similarities with dread that I noted. Uh, One of them is Metroid dread is like, mostly linear like somewhat non-linear you can sequence break a bit and you Mm -hmm. do have a little bit of freedom but both of these games dread and samus returns when you hit the point where the game decides you are moving on to the next point there's a bunch of one-way exits is what Mm -hmm. i'm saying Mm -hmm. you hit that point where the game is like you're on to the next level i don't care if you're not done exploring here you can't go back until much later dread has that too and Dread is like a little bit, uh, this, this game I felt was very linear, less linear than, um, AM2R because you do get locked out of backtracking more than AM2R was, I guess linear is the, not the perfect word for it, but you know what I mean? Segmented. Yeah. Segmented. Dread I mean, is Super the Metroid had its moments with that, but Dread yeah. and Samus Returns are a little more in the same way that they're more cinematic and showy with all everything they do. Yeah. It also showcases that a little more. And that's another thing that I really liked about this game that they did really well in Dread 2 was as much as I got tired of parrying the same like bird enemies that were dive bombing me, Mm -hmm. when you get into these boss fights and you get that like cinematic parry to finish off the boss fight, it's fucking awesome. And yeah, yeah, Chef Kiss, it's fantastic. And it's something that they... They iterated on, they made it better in Dread, but it was also already really good in Samus Returns. I think that's yeah. what kept me going ultimately with this game is like even when I was like frustrated with how long some of the areas were, how empty they were, I would then get to one of these boss fights and have that cool moment. Be like, yeah, all right, let's yeah. keep going. Yeah. So one, of, one of the things about Metroid and about Samus is Samus is like one of the most like stone cold badass video game hero characters, right? Yeah. But the, the limitations of... The Nintendo, the Super Nintendo, the Game Boy Advance, they didn't give you the opportunity to have such cinematic moments. And in this game, you finally do start to see those, see Samus pull off some of these really badass, like finishing moves on these bosses. It's Mm. something that like people really took to with Dread, but it's here. This is, uh, other than maybe Prime, again, haven't played those, but it's the first Mm -hmm. time in these 2D games when you'd start to see this, I think. Yeah, I mean, well, also in in Metroid Fusion, you're running the whole game too. So, like, you're yeah, not a you're badass being in that game. Yeah. You're being mm-hmm. hunted, which is kind of a spin on that, right? Because in the first two games, you are a badass. You're kind of an unstoppable force. And, and I think it also. Oh, go sorry. ahead, Jeff. No, and it almost feels like Fusion gives you the Metal Gear Solid Two moment of when you're playing as Raiden, you can finally see how badass Solid Snake is. It's like you watch <laughs> the SAX happen, and you're just like hiding in the shadows, looking through the vents. Is this what I do to people? Yeah, <laughs> I'm awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. So, uh, uh, anything else before we get into the spoiler talk for Samus Returns? I was just gonna say I was gonna push back a little bit on 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 cases like the design element. I totally get it, right? Like if you're just looking at what came before this game, it does it is closer to the future of Metroid than its past. But I do mm-hmm. think that the one thing I'll push back is on the control. I think Samus controls as well here as she has in the other games, if not better. I think that it doesn't feel that alien from previous control. Yes, the aiming was a little wonky and took some getting used to. And I agree with Dave, the 3DS thumbstick stinks. I have the XL, the new XL, which is the best of them. And it's still Me stinks. too. It still stinks. Yep. <laughs> um, but like, I think what I like about better here than AM2R is there is a stiffness in Super Metroid and there's a stiffness in AM2R that is familiar that I don't feel as much in Fusion. I know that 
not everyone else felt that, but I think it's just because I've played all of these games so many times, with the exception of obviously this this game specifically. Um, when I did get to play this, I was like, "Oh, this feels great." And then when I got to Dread, I was like, "Oh, this feels even better." Like I felt like it was iteration on previous movement, not wholly different. But I can see how also if you've only played. Like, if you've played the older games mostly and then you jump into this, it can feel a little different. I will, however, in the point in everyone's column about this game feeling too long, I played a lot of Metroid 2 and then I played all of AM2R. I did not replay this game before we recorded. I am relying on my memory from two years two years ago because mm-hmm. I remember in the tail end it feeling long in the tooth. And so I won't fight that it can drag even if I really enjoyed it at the time I was playing it. That doesn't mean Mm -hmm. that it is a bloated game. It isn't a bloated game because I would agree that especially the sections that we were talking about before where you're chasing stupid alphas from room to room completely unnecessary and serve no purpose other than to extend the length of the game. I shouldn't be yakety sack slamming door chasing (laughs) down a Metroid. Right. Yeah. I don't care how cool we all are. That, I, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> Just to clarify, I, I don't think that this game is worse in play than sure. the other ones. I, what I mean is that they are just different. And yeah. I, I, I said in our chat, I compare the gunplay actually weirdly to Turrican. Like, mm, um, I've okay. played Fusion and Zero Mission a lot. Um, yeah. the, uh, I, those are, probably the two I've gone back to the most uh, sure. just because I had an NVIDIA shield that for whatever reason, it just felt right to do Game Boy Advance more than Super Nintendo. Um, so I've played those probably the most recently in, in large amounts. Although like, again, the original and Super Metroid, I played a ton. Um, and it's just, there is the, there, the gunplay isn't the sole focus because it's exploration first. And like the, right. the movement's kind of stiff and limited and just sort of like, uh, a necessary evil. It's not like a Contra. It's not like even a Mega Man game where like no. the gunplay is the, the, the main focus. Th- this is leaning into more of like, you're really good at it because you're going to be dealing with like bigger threats and you have to deal with all those things. Like even just the posture of, of the way Samus stands as she fires her gun is different than the way it is in AM2R and the others where it's like much right. more like fully flat and like the blasts are coming out versus you kind of like the, the guns a little bit more like held in check and like it, it's all more natural. It's all more, you know, uh, action packed. And those are all really cool. And I, I, I really like the engine. It just is a new engine that is working on uh, like designed for this new era of video gaming, right. as opposed mm-hmm. to being like, here's a really like lush update to a really old game with quality of life improvements. Right. Um, exactly. And that, that's where the difference is in terms of like what the game is. And like, again, if, I, I would have no objection to this game whatsoever if it was completely advertised as like, oh, you bought Dread? Check this out. We've got a bonus game that is <laughs> Metroid 2. Um, mm. I, I also would love it if this game came with Metroid 2, which is unfortunate that it doesn't the way that Zero Mission did come with the original Metroid. Like, yeah, like if, 100% the game you unlock the original. Yeah. Oh, God. Can you imagine if they also had like just bought this game and like put it in there <laughs> as like a bonus for everyone? Like that would have been really cool. Um, it's 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 a new game using the layout roughly of the original right. with this new engine. And there yeah. are points where there's friction between them. That's the only real complaint I have to it. Cause I, I do really enjoy it. I'm really loving this game as a whole. And I can't like, again, I can't, I just can't wait to play dread. Like it's this, this playthrough has been really exciting, even though nice. I've been playing it on a retro uh, pocket three plus, which is, you'll know, not a two screened device. And so like, you have to like hit the thumbstick mm-hmm. to switch between, div- uh, between screens. And oh my fucking God, the fact that I can't pause and switch my weapon is so annoying when I have to like switch away from like the screen I'm looking at <laughs> in a fight yeah. to be like, well, I guess I need the freeze beam right now. I have to always just like anticipate like this might be a room where there's a Metroid. I better have the freezer, <laughs> the freeze beam armed, uh, because there's just no way to do it mid combat. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do enjoy the ways that they utilize the weapon switching and weapon combinations yeah. in Samus Returns. Having to to go back to Return of Samus, having to swap out whether I have a wave beam or the ice beam or something like that, let's not mince words, sucks. Well, just yeah. as as a reminder, though, 
the ice beam is the only one that is unique from the others because the way after that point, the wave beam, the spacer and the plasma beam are just upgrades upon each other. Uh, exactly. In Metroid 2, in, in Return of Samus on the Game Boy, you had to swap those. Yeah. As well. And I couldn't quite remember all the names on them. Hmm. But also the fact Again, that... Again, I played this game a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Absolutely. And so the fact that with Samus Returns, when you're doing the hold the shoulder button and aim with the stick... If you have the grapple beam and you happen to target a grappleable a grappleable area, you don't have to switch to the grapple beam. Oh, thank yeah. you for mentioning that. That's the yeah. that's such incredible game design right there. Yeah. yeah. Like I'm almost annoyed to even bother having like a grapple beam as an option. <laughs> like because it's like like such brilliant, like, oh yeah, just lock on and you're good. <laughs> it's great. And they do a lot of those little ones, and I almost wish they'd explained it better. But also it was fun to discover. Yeah. That's all fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've I've complained a little bit about, well, not a little bit. I've complained quite a bit about some of the design of this game. And I, I did say it's my least favorite of the three, but it's not like I was having a horrible time playing it. I've definitely had worse times playing games over the last couple months than Samus Returns. So I think this is a good time to uh, take our little spoiler break for Samus Returns, come back, clean up. Uh, there is... Um, the usual ending sequence stuff to talk about and then one notable addition to this game that uh yeah music So into the spoiler section for Samus Returns, um, I guess, is there anything before the Queen that we want to talk about? Yeah, Digger Knot can go jump off a cliff. <laughs> yeah, <agreed. laughs> yeah. I Yeah, uh, I said earlier that I, I liked the inclusion, the way that you could use the spider ball to avoid attacks in a lot of these boss fights. You know, going up mm-hmm. on the ceiling when the floor is lava or whatever, but that, uh, that fight sucked. Uh, I just... Felt like I had like one second less than I needed to like mm-hmm. get into those little like attachments and bomb and stuff like that. So yeah, not a fan. Yeah, it felt like one too many cool boss fight mechanics. Any one of them was actually a lot of fun. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Started nice. I felt like a genius once I took down the first arm and got in there and did that whole thing. But it's just a little too many things. There's very few, if any, other sequences where before that where the spider ball would hold true even when you're attacked. So there's mm-hmm. very little telegraphing there. That took me a while to get. And the last phase does not belong there. No. <laughs> it's just a whole it's, frustrating mess, mm-hmm. that boss fight. Yeah, that could have been a cool puzzle unto itself. That could have been a cool main event of a boss where that was most of what you're doing. But there was already one too many those cool little things. And this was the final phase. And I just wanted it dead. It was very satisfying that the cinematic afterwards is Samus like 360 no scoping it. Yeah. Yeah. But still and all. Listen, I know that Mercury Steam is terrified of the power that they've wrought with what they made the power bomb. But this wasn't worth it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. Yeah, any other notable bosses or anything like that? Well, general thing with, like, all the boss fights, and I probably should have mentioned it before, but, like, a a thing I found really frustrating was the amount of, like, that, like, weird yellow, like, slime sections in boss fights where, like, Mm. the whole ceiling and sidewalls are just unusable for the spider balls. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And it, it was really annoying because it felt like the consistent issue of using the spider ball in Metroid games, which is that it has such versatility or at the very least the ability to like abstract a lot of these fights. Like it was like, well, why in this like just basic square room that you're in or basic rectangle room you're in, can't you like go over the Metroid when like you can't hurt the Metroid from that angle. You can't do anything with it. Like no, why, why even bother? And it just felt like, well, we don't know how the game's going to be broken if that is included. So we're just going to like yeah. lock you out of using like what is, a huge tool that we want you to use in so many places and is only in this game yeah it's you're right it's frustrating yeah i i just in general find the the all all the regular enemies like their aggression so frustrating and like the lead up to the fight with the queen where you're surrounded by enemies and then the after the queen where there's so many enemies before you get to the big thing <laughs> like it's yeah, just like um, oh come on like 
the, again, this whole hostile environment, like you don't feel like the apex predator that you do at the end of the original Metroid and of a M2R. Like right. you feel like you're part of this incredibly hostile world that I guess it kind of feels like you're living on the Krogan homeworld kind of thing where everything just wants, is out to kill you. <laughs> and I do have to say that, yes, I do enjoy like as far as pros, cons, how it falls out in the wash. I like the parry mechanic. I like it a lot. And it did feel like it was using it too much at the beginning. But once you started getting better weapons and everything and I could take things out better at a distance, it became just a part of my repertoire. And when I was backtracking and kind of taking extra circuits through the world to get all the items 100 percent, which is what I did, I did relish how easily I could conquer early areas like that is where I felt like the apex predator. That is where I felt just a good old stomping that felt great for my self-esteem not gonna yeah, lie for sure it's it's always a good thing in metroidvanias to go back to old areas with your upgraded weapons and just kind of wreck shop as you go clean up power-ups and stuff yeah exactly and this one ha- did did that remarkably yeah yeah um another thing i think this game did remarkably was i really liked the queen final boss fight yeah i, I thought it was excellent uh, mm-hmm. multiple not multiple stages in the way that am 2 rs was like you fight for a while then it breaks down the wall then you fight for a while then it breaks down another wall etc this one has proper multiple stages yeah and it it gave me a really good uh goldilocks zone of being difficult but extremely learnable so that the time that i did beat it i skilled the fuck out of it and just demolished it yeah and that little bit extra wiggle room like in the room like it goes a long way yeah. yeah, and it's it's not something that Metroid games give you often is that, like, you know, that opportunity to 100% skill. And I know that there are some people who are really good at these games who can skill the resource check bosses, but I felt that this, as with all most of the Metroids in general in this game, was a pure, you learn this fight, you skill your way through it fight obviously you have to have enough missiles to do enough damage but yeah i I felt great about it but i also appreciate that the other metroid fights when you run out of missiles you can hurt them with the ice beam right yeah yeah i think that was the best addition to this game is letting you use the ice beam to also damage them i think it was just unnecessary Mm -hmm. because making the resource a hard stop was the most frustrating thing about the other two versions of the Mm -hmm. game if you ran out of missiles you were dead that was it there was nothing you could do um, mm-hmm. which doesn't exist in this game and I'm thankful for. And this uh, isn't a survival horror Metroidvania. worked in AM2R. It, it did not. It didn't? it didn't? Okay. Nope. It never um, really came up for me because I don't, like... Right. I mean, I, you, I, also, depending I, on how... The, like, the resources are way more plentiful in AM2R than the first game, for sure. Absolutely, um, yeah. But um, also, I love the Queen fight because it is absolutely the blueprint for the fights in Dread. So much, yeah. mm-hmm. so many of the great fights in Dread are absolutely this multi-phase, learnable... Like we talk about this in the Dread side quests episode we did mm-hmm. with uh, uh, Alex Lavelle. I never, even when I was at my most frustrated in Dread, I felt like I could learn it eventually. Whereas in this game, that was like for some of the fights, they are still that that resource check. But this fight, this final fight, was like I was frustrated. Well, sort mm-hmm. of final fight. We'll get to that. Uh, this fight felt learnable in a way that then the thing we're about to talk to next just felt frustrating and and not as learnable and more just rote memorization in like a less fun way this felt fun Mm -hmm. to execute Mm -hmm. and once you did you like you felt like that badass that we've talked about samus being yeah we haven't mentioned this part but the checkpoint system in this game outside of the save states or not save Mm. states but like save points like the fact that you can die right before boss fight and it'll reload you right before that fight right um fucking amazing it yes it takes uh, on from the standpoint of like not having to stress on the other hand you're like less scared going into a boss fight or like being like well there might be a metroid in the next room uh because it'll just right. like, reload you to that spot but um yeah. from a uh quality of life standpoint uh, amazing i loved it mm-hmm. yeah fantastic and that That feeling of like being scared because I'm going to lose my progress as opposed to I'm scared because of what might I might find in the next room. Uh, I much prefer the latter, the feeling of like, 
oh shit, there might be a next Metroid and I haven't had a save point in 25 minutes is an extremely like artificial way of making me feel tense that I don't appreciate as much as I get older. Yeah, agreed. Also wasted yeah. time, right? As we get yeah, older. Yeah, not the time for this shit. I, I mean, there's pros and cons to it because like that is a way of elevating the stakes in what is a video game. Like how do you feel the actual fear of a thing? Mm -hmm. Well, it's costing you time in a way that like wouldn't be the way for most video games. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I, but again, from a, just like a, a pure, like, well, I, I'm not going to rip my hair out and, you know, throw a controller at a wall kind of scenario, having the ability to like reload right outside of where that fight occurred. Yeah, is, absolutely. Is nice. <laughs> yep. Uh, so after the queen, um, you have the baby Metroid sequence, which is notable in Samus Returns because it's way different from the other two versions of the game. Uh, and it makes me wonder why, because it's not this peaceful like victory lap through the rest of the game. The music is different. It's not the quiet and contemplative type music as you got out in the other two games. It is uh, like this pulsing combat music with the melody from the original song in the mix, basically. Mm -hmm. But it has a much different feel, and you're fighting the entire time as you leave. And maybe that was a sign of things to come once you actually got back to your ship. Yeah, because as you fight <laughs> your way through, when you get back to your ship and you think you have a victory, you are encountered by the biggest thorn in your side, Ridley, a yeah, sort of Mecha Ridley because he's not quite Mecha Ridley yet, but like he's actually, from what I understand, is sort of coming fresh off of the loss at the end of the Metroid Prime trilogy, right? And so, like, this, like, is, this is based off of that, right? And so, it's cool because now having played Metroid Prime One at least, the fact that those games are between this and the mm -hmm. first game makes this moment really cool, right? Because it cements mm -hmm. this rivalry since we really killed your parents, all of that backstory in case folks don't have it. But this fight itself is really, I think the cinematic nature of it was really cool, but the fight itself is hard in a way that no other Metroid fight in the franchise is. I just feel like some of it is feels very unfair and almost like you by the end, I was just memorizing and counting. Like, which mm -hmm. is a way to beat bosses. And I know there are other games that do that too, but it just kind of felt overwhelming here in a way that it hasn't. Now, thankfully, here doesn't happen what Dave alluded to. When you die here, you still fight here. You don't have to do the whole thing all over again, thank God. Right. However, this is a multi-phase boss fight. The phases can take quite a long time as you yep. wait for your window to attack. And if you die, you start at the first phase. Correct. And, like, eventually the way I got through it was taking it very slowly um, and fighting each phase and not taking any risks. And that's a boring way to do a, f a, a, a Metroid fight, right? Because you want to take risk, risk versus reward, be able to know, you know, like, not get hit and skill check it. But this was beyond that. I think it was a test of patience, and I had none left. <laughs> yep. My... My kind of like go to for things like this, because it is a learnable fight, just like the queen fight was. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I will praise it for being a learnable fight, but it is so long because your windows for attack are so few and far between. Because if you get hit, Ridley, Ridley hits really fucking hard. Yeah. So if you get hit, it's a big deal. So you really have to do be extra careful in this fight. And the telltale thing for me was when I did beat it and I beat it, you know, again, in a very skillful way, I didn't get hit that many times. I mastered the fight, but when I beat it, my thought was not fuck. Yeah. I beat the game. It was fuck. Yeah. I don't have to do that shit again. Yeah, mm. <laughs> exactly. To contrast all this, I really liked that fight. Okay. <laughs> because I mean, I did get risky. I learned the patterns and I didn't bother using missiles until the final phase. I just went with my blaster and that it's one of the few bosses that actually takes damage from that. And so that meant I didn't have to aim as hard of getting this, you know, getting the head was still the weak spot and that was still like the skill point. But if I could just chip away at him while I'm going, I did. And it felt very cool where I criticize he doesn't need the second phase. First phase, third phase, great phases. Mm -hmm. There's enough contrast there. The third phase is when the baby Metroid gets in there. You know, Ridley is hitting like the mecha dragon truck that he is. 
and has you on the ropes and the met baby Metroid takes some energy, gives it to you and starts attacking him. And his form changes up a lot more that way. I think that would have taken out enough time in what would have felt like a slog. I didn't start busting out super missiles until that third phase. And let me tell you, that felt epic as hell for me. And I had plenty of them because I didn't use them in the first phase. I've, I tried at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But once I had the strategy of, now save him for the end. It Because it's he's, he does slow down a little more and he telegraphs bigger. So at that point, I'm already in the zone of what the fight is. And those are my favorite kinds of boss fights. When I just get into a groove, a rhythm, the zone. It might have been a long boss fight. I didn't notice. And that's the other thing, too, where also I was on hour 15 and I was trying to beat it for this podcast. So I did mm -hmm. have a little bit of a fuck. Yeah, I don't have to do that again. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed the fight while I was doing it. I would say my criticism is we don't need the second phase. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I mean, that, that was the padding. Like, arguably, the original queen fight is a fuck yeah, I don't have to do that again kind of fight. Also true. It's, it's a war of attrition kind of, like, we just have to go through it all. And I, I like the fact that we use the Metroid in an actual, like, story way there. That's pretty cool. But I think it misses the catharsis, or or not the catharsis, the um uh the, the emotional breather of the, the end, like, escape, mm -hmm. or whatever you would describe it as. Like, the like that whole experience is a chance to relax and to release all this tension that is occurring from that all. Um, and to end the game was just like, yeah, it's another fucking fight. Like, and then the game's over kind of component mm -hmm. is again, it's just a different game than what it was coming off of. Yeah. And it, it's like, well, yeah, we're, we're shoe, we we're shoehorning in more game mechanics. And like, while yes, it's cool. And yes, from a like a machete order standpoint of the Metroid series where you're playing mm. zero mission and then all three prime games and then this and then you're going on to Super Metroid and, <laughs> and then Fusion and then Dread. And like that's the order you're playing at all. Like, yeah, it adds a lot to the story of like the, the war between Ridley and Samus, but it's not the story of this game. It's just an extra part of a of a larger feud. And so it, again, it's just like from a different perspective of how do you approach it? It feels like a flashback as opposed to here is the game as it was released, but updated for now. It's from the dread perspective, looking back on like, God, can you remember that time I had to clear out all the Metroids from SR 388? That was, that was wild. <laughs> oh boy. Ridley's here. Have, have a slice buddy. But I think also, Ridley's appearance from a headcanon, canon, whatever standpoint, is important because it does close. It sort of links up the Prime Trilogy, which is super cool. It also gives us, OK, why was Ridley, you know, Mecha Ridley and everything else in Prime? And then he's just a little bitch at the beginning of Super Metroid. Is he tracking <laughs> down this, the Metroid? What's going on with that? Having him show up to try to get it is like, OK, this is going on and this leads into the next one. One could argue. That you a way to have your cake and eat it too is to have that relaxing release, that unclenching from the from the Metroid Queen. You get to your ship, and it's a cutscene. Like yeah, Ridley shows up, and you basically hyperdrive your ship through him, kind of thing. Right, and he's following. Hmm. That would be pretty cool, and you would also get people going. Well, why didn't I get to fight him? Yeah. And that's uh, alien to me because it. I have a, a bit of maybe a hot take. I don't know. Every Metroid game that I've played where Ridley is a boss fight, Ridley is my least favorite boss fight in all the games that I have Super Metroid, Fusion, and Samus Returns. Uh, I liked Ridley way less than that excavator robot in Samus mm. Returns. This is by wow. far my least favorite. Now, I didn't have the context of the Prime trilogy, so this felt... This felt like fan service to me. This felt like, well, it's a Metroid game. You got to fight Ridley, don't you? So here's Ridley. But it's like Ridley, with that here's Ridley. Of, yeah. yeah, a little yeah. bit of extra context, I suppose, helps um, with why Ridley's there in the first place. I would also mm -hmm. say when you're remaking something, right, and you're very familiar with this, Dave, because at this point you're in your oeuvre, you've done a bunch of remakes as standalone mm -hmm. episodes. You did Resident Evil 4, for example, not that long, yeah. long ago of when we were recording, at least it aired. Um, mm. Like... You want to change things. You don't want to change things. I think you're never going to please everybody with a remake and you're going to, and I think everyone's going to take risks. 
I agree that this fight, I think Jeff is the nice kind of like in between of us. I think Jeff is right. I think if this fight were a little shorter, but still difficult, it would be more enjoyable. And yeah. from a narrative point, now having played Prime and Ridley is the final boss of that and a huge pain in the ass, but kind of in a satisfying way. Uh, shocker, Ridley's the final boss of a Metroid game. Sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> like, I, I appreciate this fight in retrospect now having played Prime 1. I still haven't played Prime 2 or 3, so I don't know if he's in those as well. But, like, having that fight happen and whooping his ass eventually and then kicking his ass here, like, it does feel worthwhile. Uh, but I also, like, Metroid has a history of cinematic final boss fights, right? We talked about the original game feeling kind of cinematic, even though they don't clue you into it. And then, you know, Fusion, that whole ending, ending sequence is pretty cinematic, even though you do have to fight your way through that final fight. And I mean, Super Metroid famously, like, baby Metroid saves the day kind of thing without going into more detail. But like, Mm -hmm. I think this lacking that cinematic moment, except when the baby Metroid's kind of helping you, like if it was shorter and like the whole third, like half of the third phase was just this kind of cinematic using the counter, turning it into a cutscene and then escaping thing would mm-hmm. kind of streamline this in a way that the fight as it is feels a little, like you said in your notes, like I get it. Like we have to fight yeah. Ridley. Like why does it have yeah. to be this long? It's it's it gets to a point for sure where like another phase pops up and I'm like oh fuck you come <laughs> on yeah and I I re- I'd never want to get to that point in a boss fight when like I think I've won twice already and now there's, there's another phase surprise yeah. mm-hmm. uh, so to be fair some of the, your favorite games of all time do that and I say that when it happens oh. to me yeah for sure oh I say that <laughs> yeah. I say that in some of those games too if you if you don't know it's coming for yeah. sure mm-hmm. so. All right. Well, uh, let's uh, let's do the little uh, music break and come back and um, kind of wrap this up. Talk about who we would recommend, what games we would recommend um, from these to a new player. All right, so we're out of the spoiler section for Samus Returns, and it's time to wrap this up. So I think the way that I want to wrap this up, um, I think we've we've given our thoughts about all three games in their individual sections. So just a, a question here for for someone who wants to experience what's going on in Metroid Two, which game would you recommend that they play first? The original from the Game Boy, AM Two R the remake, or the three DS remake Samus Returns? Oh, that's such a like you'd think it'd be an easy question to answer, right? I mean, I think for a new player who has never played like a Metroid, a version of Metroid Two, but maybe has played Zero Mission, I doubt I'd recommend the original. I think the age shows. I think it's great if you want to experience it as an experiment, but I think either Samus Returns or AM Two R would be better served for a player who hasn't played Metroid Two before. Now, if you haven't played mm-hmm. any Metroid game before and you just played zero mission and you want to play something aim 2r does seem like the natural next step if you've played all of the metroid games but somehow missed metroid 2 i would recommend samus returns because if you've already played dread a lot of it's going to feel familiar um though less refined than dread that's kind of where i'm coming at it from a recommendation standpoint okay yeah i like i would like i said before like the quadrilogy of it all like if you aren't factoring dread in to it. And I mean, even if you are as, as, as the, the fifth point, like AM2R fits better between zero mission and super Metroid as like the sequence of games. If you don't care quite so much, like if, if you're like, no, I'm down to play all of them or play a, a sizable portion of them, I would say have AM2R be your second game in that sequence. Um, and then, play Samus Returns before you play Dread. Like, that kind of makes sense to me just in terms of, like, what what it's all doing. Because we didn't talk about, like, the Aeon powers, for example, which I think, like, cool, but, like, is just more stuff. Like, there's like yeah. there's a lot being crammed into Samus Returns that, like, is, is just getting away from, like, what was the second game in the series. <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, I, I think that 
AM2R does like a good job of not going overboard on it while having still like things that are, are nice, like the ability to grab ledges and stuff like that. But, um, it, it could have very easily gone overboard. And I, I feel like Samus Returns kind of does if you're seeing it as part of like the second chapter in this whole sequence. Um, as opposed to like, it's a later game to like go back and be like, Oh, that was, that, that was a fun adventure, right? On SR388. Like that's where Samus Returns is really good. Um, so I would say if you really don't want to backtrack on general plot overview, I probably would say just skip eight, uh, Samus Returns and play Zero Mission AM2R Super Fusion Dread. Um, if you don't mind it, put Samus Returns between Fusion and Dread. Um, but I feel like AM2R, because it was designed to be here is Zero Mission, but for Metroid 2, fits so much better as the second one in that sequence and then going into super, which holds up really well, even if there's some quality of life stuff that's missing. So that that's kind of where I stand on this one. Also one negative I haven't said about this one. Samus returns has some really like interesting visual design stuff going on in the background, really great use of the 3d space. I I love like mm-hmm. the, the random animals that are like in the background that are just like totally details. It's fucking ugly compared to AM2R. <laughs> AM2R is like lush and, and bright and really attractive and, Samus Returns looks like you kit bash Smash Brothers to create like your Metroid 2 remake. And like, that's fine, but it's just not as attractive visually speaking. And like, I've seen what they do with Dread and like Dread is like a huge upgrade in that, in that space. And like, you can see that this is just the test ground on that engine. Um, and like, it's a great engine and they, they clearly have made an amazing game following it up. And the game itself is really good. But in terms of just being like, attractive <laughs> like am2r like and i always go for sprites over over polygons if i can help it so like it's it's kind of my bias there but like it's it's a really attractive game the fact that it's a fan game kind of doesn't even matter it's just it looks really good like you show it off and you're like man that's a really fucking good version of metroid 2 and this mm-hmm. is like it's there's a lot of good stuff and there's some really great details but like that that color palette just isn't as lush and as as nice to look at as much. I think it's really funny that I'm thinking about this and probably the most easily accessible version for the average Nintendo fan is the original on Nintendo switch online. It is. Yeah. yeah. Because I actually would recommend Samus returns as, as the first one, as a top thing, there are circumstances, reasons, exceptions, and a good amount of them where I would say do am two R because it is fantastic. It's well-made. It is beautiful and very cool for all the reasons case just enumerated and I, I don't disagree but i really like samus returns i do love it set up kind of as the prototype for dread and there again if you are somebody with a switch and you're going to be playing metroid dread i don't see it going wrong there i'm also fine with things being a little fast and loose like that and i would say as a as a first one or as a which one should i play that one if you want to link it up a little better, do you want like a full through line experience? AM2R. I need to play anything. What have you got? I got this switch. I play Metroid 2, but here I'm going to send you a map. Like use it. And, yeah. and honestly, the version on Nintendo Switch Online has save states. And I've said this several times. If you have save states and a map, it is not a bad way to play the game. Honestly, it is the way that you would be able to take it and en- enjoy it. In the modern age, and there and there we are. Yeah, um, I I think I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball here, and uh, for a new player, I think mm-hmm. I'm going to recommend they play the original uh, nice. with, like you said, with save states and a map. Um, and it's it's kind of like I said when I was talking about my experience with the original. It was a rough first hour or so as I wrapped my head around how this game works, because I'm so used to the Game Boy Advance Metroid games. I played yeah. Fusion like three or four times. Um, I played Zero Mission. Uh, I've never, um, you know, like I said, I've never beaten Super Metroid. Like the the GBA Metroid is Metroid to me. That being said, there was enough to really enjoy about the original. And once you have save states and a map, there was not a whole lot of friction standing between me and finishing the game. This isn't like me playing Zelda 2 with save states and a map and a guide and still not being able to beat that fucking game. It wasn't that bad. Um, And that's the biggest takeaway from me playing all three of these games in a row after hearing 
so many people shit on Metroid 2 for the last like several years as I've been, you know, getting into like video game discussions more and more. So many people hate Metroid 2 and I don't get it. I think it's a really good game. Um, no, it's, it's just yeah. you need yeah. you need the supplementary materials that and I'm really glad Case said this a long time ago, almost three hours ago now, that in 1991, you would have had those supplementary materials anyway. No yeah. one was playing that game blind. And if they did, they were not taking advantage of things that could have helped them. Or you were mapping it yourself or someone else's right. school yeah, yeah, was yeah. mapping it or whatever exactly. it was. Yeah. And there's that other subset of people who really enjoy making their own maps uh, for games, which Metroid 2 would be weird because there's some weird connections between the zones that don't Agreed. Uh, work super well with mapping yourself, I think. But I digress. Um I would recommend if you if you know yourself and you think um, I am just not going to get on with the Game Boy game, even with save states in a map, then I would recommend playing AM2R. And I'm on a pretty firm like I don't really recommend Samus Returns unless you fucking love Dread. If you love Dread and you didn't play Samus Returns, then a lot of the stuff you liked about Dread is going to be in that game. Yeah. Otherwise, I think it's the worst of the three versions of Metroid two. And it's really just because it is way too fucking long. And I, I really like that bothers me more than maybe some people. So yeah, the original Metroid two big surprise, but I, I really enjoyed it. A surprise to me as well. And hmm. other people who know, who may know me and my general thoughts about going back and playing games that are as old as uh, Metroid two was, I'm not always a fan. I'm not usually a fan. But I am a fan of that. So, yeah, good uh, good talk, everybody. This is, um, you know, I was talking to Matt before we started recording. I was like, I think we can get this done in about two hours. But here we are. <laughs> this and Matt really just good, laughed uh, because he was like, well, Jeff and Case are about to come on. <laughs> yeah, was, Matt did. They did laugh and um, say, hey, uh, you know who's coming on the show, right? So, yeah, <laughs> here we are. This is me trying to be succinct. Yeah. Um, well, all of us, I think, tried, but there are f there are four of us. It's so a th yeah. it's a four phase fight here. Yeah, exactly. Here we are. So um, let's uh, take a little bit of time, as we always do, to give one final plug for the things that you make and where people can find you. Uh, Case, I will start with you again. Where can people find you and your shows? Okay, so most of the stuff I do is at certainpov.com, as is for all of us. Um, so again, Another Pass is a movie show where we talk about movies that we find fascinating but flawed, uh, or movies that had a lot of issues in their production and like overcame it through creativity. So that's that's a really fun conversation. We always have really fun guests co coming on, and it's just a great time. And we try not to be negative about movies, even if it's a movie where like there's a big a lot of problems with it. Um, other show, Men of Steel, Superman and Superman adjacent stuff. So if you like comic book kind of power fantasy kind of stuff, that it's a really good place for that. Um, again, a lot, lot of fun there. And then uh, the Certain POV me uh, Media YouTube channel is where all of my video stuff is up. Uh, I do a, a one series in particular called Superman Analogs, where I just ramble for like five-ish minutes about characters who are kind of inspired by Superman. And that's a really broad swath. Uh, but I try to keep it to characters who are like, yeah, no, this is like Superman in this setting because X. And I try to make a, a case for each of these characters. So uh, th those are all things you should check out. And uh, please do. All right. Hell yeah. And uh, Matt and Jeff, take it away. Well, you can find Fun and Games, our video game culture podcast with interviews and all sorts of other fun discussions on certainpov.com or you can find us on most social media at fun and games pod twitter instagram patreon wherever you can find us and you can find me on any sort of social media as jeff makes noise and jeff is spelled g-e-o-f-f -F. you can also find a permanent invite link to our discord server on any of the uh, episodes of our podcast on the website uh, it's a great community dave's over there we're always talking about cool stuff video games comic books tv movies um Absolutely. you used to be able to find me on twitter at dj underscore storm again but that's not <laughs> the case anymore so i've kind of set up shop <laughs> at fun and games pod uh so that's also sometimes me but i try and clarify uh i'm on blue sky if you have blue sky i'm dj storm again there because they hate underscores uh mm -hmm. but but otherwise uh, you can find all of my podcasts at CernPVA.com. You can find everything I do at DJStormageddon.com. And I think that's everything. And if not, somebody yell at me on Twitter and I'll remind you. 
All right. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll second uh, the recommendations I made at the top of the show. You heard everybody here talk for three hours about these games uh, in such an intelligent way. So check down in the show notes for links, uh, whether it's movies or Superman or Superman adjacent stuff, video games, more movies on Screen Snark, and uh, yeah, Bioware games on Reignite. That's right, moving through Dragon Age. So for myself, um, I will give the customary plug to um, the best way to support your uh, favorite podcast is to tell a friend that it's your favorite podcast. Yeah, That's a big help. We also have a Discord server where all three of these fine folks are in there. Uh, we have a lovely community and we'd love to have you. There's an invite link down in the show notes for the Discord server. And if you would like to support monetarily, patreon.com slash real Dave Jackson. You will get lots of goodies for being a part of the Patreon. And yeah, my other shows called a top three podcast. Uh, we could do top three versions of Metroid 2 on that show since we do top three lists. It's no true. honorable mentions, though. Not enough games for that. But no. yeah. All right. So this has been um, an excellent discussion. Thank you all so much for joining one more time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I appreciate everyone who tunes in all the way to the end of these three-hour episodes. Tune in next week for the next game to come out of the backlog. <laughs>